three, two. Oh my God. Uh, what's up? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the program. The Airtime Podcast is presented by Van Shoes since 1966. There's nothing fake about it. Have something to believe in and be yourself. You know what I'm saying? All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. Today's guest, a good friend of mine, professional snowboarder, painter, poker player, one of my best friends, heroes, um, best style on and off the board, and somebody who just goes above and beyond. Solid human, some would say. He even collects jackets and gives them to homeless people before the winter. And guess what? He doesn't post about it, and it's not on social media because he just does it from the good old kindness of his heart. And he's been in the game since the 90s, and he's a huge inspiration and uh, for the Whistler community, and he's just the guy that everybody looks up to. He's just the guy. Um, and he still boards more than most people. So he's been after it for probably about 30 years now. How long Do you think you've been boarding for 30 years? 88. Rube Goldberg, everybody. Boarding since 88. Welcome to the show. How you doing? <laughs> 88, 98, 08, 18. Wow, 34. Five? 35 30, years? going to be 35. That Pretty went quick, cool. I bet. Hi, Jody. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Thanks so, for hiring me many years ago. Rube gave me a job, everybody, a long time ago. That's true. And uh, I'll probably still be looking for work, but uh, what, do you, what have you been up to lately? Lately, just it's summertime, so we're working away. How long have you been at it with your painting company now? With the cheeseburger? Uh, I actually, I think it's about, it's five years since cheeseburger started. But we've been painting for, since 2007. Most people right now are hella confused. They're like, cheeseburger what? Did I hear well, I just, cheeseburger? I had, to, I had to incorporate my business and I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I was like, pff, I, I couldn't think of a name. And uh, I didn't think it really mattered. So this is what I got. For those that don't know, we live in Whistler. It's uh, one of the most, I don't know, wealthy kind of zones as far as people who actually own the real estate here. You name your painting company Cheeseburger. Have you ever had clients be like, yo, who's the guy that got the contract for painting? His name's Cheeseburger. Because I feel like most people would stereotype Cheeseburger painting as like, this like shitty painting company, yeah, sure. but I've worked with you for a long time, sure. and you're probably would. What would you say? Are you amongst the highest of uh, what's your tier of painting? What's your level? I'm the best. Do you, yeah, <laughs> do you really think you're the best though? Do you think well, someone? I do my with... best. I, I do my best. So I'm the I, best. How expensive are the houses that you're painting? Like, you know, are they a million bucks, or have you ever? We painted... just finished one that was uh, twenty six million. So they want it done. Good. Yeah, that one sucked. You really, yeah, I had to do. Uh, it was a, it was a lot of work. And, and there's and no room for like, you know, a little nick on the wall. You know, you got to get everything. So yeah, yeah, they're they're nice homes. Cheeseburgers weird, but uh, once everybody saw the, like the one builder we work for said, you cannot call your company Cheeseburger. I can't, I can't invoice my clients Cheeseburger painting. Like you're right. I'm like. No way. What am I going to do? <laughs> and then the next day I got the cards in the mail and I, I threw it down on the driveway and it landed face down and he picked it up and he saw it and he's like, okay. And then he put the sign up on the front. You need to see it. Without the logo, you're just like, what? My cousin did the logo. I mean, you can buy them at the circle. You're selling them at skate shops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I'm wearing it because Steve Harris at the circle, I went in one day and I was looking for a sweater and it, it just nothing... Just plain Jane is what I'm looking for. And I was like, you need this, you need this sweater. In your... And he, he was like, is that the name of your company? And I was like, yes. And he said, let's go, let's do it. Send me a logo. <laughs> and they're actually like, it's way nicer than mine. Like I've got this a white square around here, but, and it fits, it's nice. I, but it's, yeah, you got to pay for it. 
they're like a hundred bucks, but it's worth bucks. it. It's if it's actually pretty cool, man. I don't know. Okay. okay. Cheeseburger painting. If you live in Whistler, the Sea to Sky area, well, good luck getting Rube because I feel like you're busy. Busy is an understatement. It's like you work. You're, you're booked. If you're, yeah. If you're not good at painting, right, hold on. What am I saying? If you're uh, not busy, then you suck at painting. Does that make any sense? Oh, totally in Whistler because everybody crazy. can afford a new paint job. No, but there's so much building going on. Like the phone is all day long. And who's Sometimes. your uh, apprentice? Who do you have working under you? Right now, I got Francisco Spray, JF. He's been with us four years now. And then Big Day J, Nichols. <laughs> He's back. He does about two hours a day. He's met me. And then uh, E-Man comes around once in a while. Belzil was on the last one. Rasmus start next week. Just like everybody's getting a little piece here and there. Jody, you're next. Re ideally, it's like two hours a day. That's the plan for everybody. Two hours? Yeah, then you go enjoy life. Four if you want maximum. Anything after four, you're miserable. Four hours a day. There's definitely people that are working 40 hours a week right now being like, how the fuck am I going to live off 10 hours a week? Yeah, yeah, but some, most of these people in the gang aren't fully dependent on a full 40-hour week. True. And that's true. where I'm... That's what I'm leaning towards. So, like, I'll pick and choose the jobs. Belzil hit me up, and I was like, perfect. And he just was on a job for three weeks, and that's it. Like, you walk, come in, walk out. You know, I can't overbook because uh, I've been there too, too many years. All right. Rube Goldberg, legendary yeah. painter as well, everybody. But we'll steer, steer away from cheeseburger painting. Um, childhood. What was Sorry young this. Rube up to? Well, my mom's going to want me to say this, that I was a little wimp growing up as a kid. Like, I, we grew up on a, in the country on a horse farm. I was allergic to horses, allergic to grass. I couldn't <laughs> swim. Allergic to grass? Yeah, yeah. I would get hives all over my body. And uh, we had this huge like, pool in the backyard. My dad did pretty, pretty well back in the day. And uh, we had a sick property, like 100 acres, racetrack, pond stables filled with horses and like a a huge huge pool and uh the house was awesome dude anyways so uh yeah i couldn't even go down the slide into water i don't know what happened there i can't something i was a little pussy like full-on scared of everything i'm sure it's my mom's fault somewhere in there because she babied me and was like oh you can't go on the bus in the back and take anyways so uh, growing up, I, I didn't, I wasn't, I didn't do too much, you know, I just kind of, <laughs> <laughs> I walked beside my bike instead of riding it, like, I don't know, anyways. So then we moved to, uh, from the country into this town just outside of Montreal, about 30 minutes west. And uh, that's when we started skateboarding and getting into that. I had an older brother, Sam, he's, he was skating. And so I kind of followed him around, you know with his crew and then uh <clears throat> and then what then he got a snowboard in 87 i think it was damn 87 and i got skis for some reason i don't know because so they were soft i guess <laughs> yeah yeah what the hell man <laughs> so i got the skis <clears throat> and no poles for sure and uh we were at mont rigo it's like 200 meters maybe it might, what's 200 meters? Yeah, it's really small. It's like 12 minute chair ride for 20 seconds of run. So he was shredding, I was skiing. And then uh, obviously the next year we drove down, we would always drive down to Burlington, Vermont. We go to the Burton factory and like buy, um, what's the word? Demo boards or whatever. Oh dang, yeah, used ones. Yeah, yeah, like samples or whatever for good price or whatever. And I got a Burton Air, Micro Air. It was like a, it was a limited edition. It was a different color. It was the, it's like a sea foam green or something. Cause they can't, the, the, the real one that they put out was a purple one. I'm pretty sure, but I got this Micro Air. Oh, that's a lie. What? No, my first board was a K2 G-Force. G-Force? Anyways, one of those, <laughs> it was a K2. No way. Yeah, it was a K2. Dang. It was a K2. Gator? No, it was a G-Force. I'm pretty sure if that makes any sense. Maybe. It was like a 45, 135 something. And uh, it was the following year I got the micro air. But I got that board and then I would 
and uh, snowboarding wasn't allowed at the ski hill, or you had to pass a test. So I had to like train on my on my street, and I I would build it. I built this little jump. My brother was too cool. Well, maybe it wasn't too cool, but I was too scared. So I'd go out on my own, and and there was a jump, and I'd hit it. And then I remember like grabbing the. I remember the first grab I ever made, and it was behind the back foot, like, but on, on the inside of the tail, like, yeah. <laughs> and he like, I pulled it over, like, yeah. And I was like, oh my God, yes, I did. And I ran home and whatever, I probably didn't say anything, but uh, I grabbed my board and then uh, I was pumped. And, um, and then we went to the ski hill and I remember doing the test and I fell when I stopped at the finish line or whatever. <laughs> and I thought I was going to fail, but anyways, they passed and, uh, yeah, then we were snowboarding. What were, what were the park features? Like, was it all half pipe? Were there any features? There was nothing. Oh yeah. There was nothing. There was like a pitch. Oh yeah. It was called the pitch. There was a pitch. The run was called Pepsi. I'm pretty sure. Hey man, <laughs> super French Pepsi. And there were like just like these pitches here and there and like this, the odd rock or, or one of like a lift tower side hit you know when it digs in and you just same as you oh but you had a park we well, yeah we like much like i mean you're talking 88 not early 90s yeah, yeah. like i started snowboarding like 2000 yeah 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 there was no park yet i remember they would do mounds they tried to do a half pipe but this may it was a couple years later what year are we 88 Pfft, geez, I, don't know. I can't believe i've been snowboarding since 88 i didn't even realize how long you've been doing it for yeah yeah so, yeah, Mont Rigo, that's where we were. And then you just fully fell in love with it, and then yeah. you committed after the grab, yeah. and then, yeah, and then yeah. you're like, fucking a movie yeah, to yeah. Whistler. Like, what happened? Well, we, we, uh, <laughs> what, we got our license. We were skiing at night every night. Then we upgraded to Mont saint Sever where they have uh, Shakedown and all that stuff. Up north a bit. It's Did like you get a- to see some Shakedowns live as a kid? I was old by then. What are you talking about? It's 2010 or something. <laughs> but, uh... We would go to Sever now because we can drive. It's about forty-five minute drive. So finish school, go up to Sever, and and ride with like some better snow. Pelshout was there. Oshu was there. I, you know what? I didn't even know what was going on because I was little. My brother was hanging with these guys, or like shredding with this crew that was amazing. My brother was so good. Like my brother was so good at snowboarding. If he he broke his leg and had to sit back, but. He was doing, I remember like switchback threes off these moguls, like in so sick and stylish, like what the, no one is doing anything. Anyways, he was there ripping uh, John Guerra, Raj Mara from Marathon, you know Raj. John, yeah, man, it's good. And then uh, Pelshat was there and Oshu, but I didn't really know them until after I moved to Whistler. And then I was like, whoa, that was you guys back then. Kind of cool, because then we got to, yeah, we got to know them pretty early on. But uh, so we shredded Sever for years and then graduate in 94. And my buddy Mike Hart and Dave had, had, drove out the year, 94 to Whistler. And I was stayed back to go to college or whatever, CJEP, and, and do a year there. And I was miserable. And all my friends were gone. And I, I was like really good in school. Throughout most of my, uh, throughout high school and everything, like honor roll nerd. No way. Yeah, yeah, I was a full nerd. And then grade 11, I realized like all my friends are slacking and they're all going to graduate. But like I had crazy anxiety. I would stress out a lot getting homework done and like freaking out. And then grade 11, I uh, I was like, I'm done. And I didn't care anymore. It was weird. And, and then I almost failed. I don't know if my mom knows this. What was the switch? Why did you think you just... I was just... Well, I honestly... What? I, I just stopped caring. I don't know what happened. I just stopped caring. And then I like had to hand in... A, I had to hand in my thesis. Oh, yeah, I can tell this. It's fine. Uh, and I tried to do it. I, it was on like... I don't even remember. But uh, I didn't do it. And I I did like a rough copy. And, and I... I was sitting in the audience during a, a whatever a meeting in the gym and my, uh, oh no, this is after my, my teacher at the time. He's like, dude, where's your, where's your paper? 
I'm like, what do you, what do you mean? It's not in there. Like I was good. I was like, I put it, I put it in there. Like, what do you want? What? And I kind of freaked out. Good. Went home, got the rough copy out. It was just like note form, whatever. And spruced it up a little bit and like threw it on his, his underneath his windshield of his Toyota Previa. And then we were at school. He's like, you're going to fail if we don't get this. And I'm like, Oh my God, I'm not going to graduate. This is insane. And then, uh, we're in the gym and listening to the meeting. I see Mr. T walks around the corner. He's like, gives me a thumbs up. And I'm like, oh my God, I just got away with it. And then I graduated. Then I went to see Jeff and I'm like, Ma, I need, a, I need a break. I need to get out of here. I was miserable. Mike and Dave are shredding pow. And I'm like, miserable. So uh, I was like, let me take a year off. So me and three buddies drove out uh, 94. Five. Dang, and you you land in Whistler, and what does Whistler look like in 1995? <laughs> yeah, I don't remember, but I think you could see McDonald's from Earl's. More so, like, what do you You could remember? see McDonald's from the taxi loop. What? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure, 100% sure, there was Damn. nothing. You'd walk to the boot, or Fitzsimmons, White Gold, there's, like, it's, anyways. There was nothing. There, there wasn't a lot, but there was still stuff. Like I don't, like I could be wrong there, but I'm pretty sure. It's pretty much the same because, like, you moved to Whistler. I couldn't, didn't know where to live. We lived in the boot for a couple months. My friends bailed; they couldn't handle it. I had dreadlocks. I had to shave my head to get a job at the ski hill, and then you got staff housing. So I lived in Brio staff housing with a bunch of people. It Damn. was pretty cool. You got to meet people, and Pelshat and them were upstairs. In Gaetan. Uh Yeah, they were on like the fourth floor or something. And uh, yeah. Did the dreads come from Jeff Brushy or did you just want dreads? It was probably to do with Brushy for sure. But my buddy Pat Conan had dreads. I was thinking about shaving or cutting my hair. And I was like, I'm going to do dreads and then I'm going to cut my hair. And then I did it and my mom liked it. I don't even think my dad could tell. And then uh, I just kept them. But it was probably brushy. You did a full year here, and then did you? Were you supposed to go home, or and you just yeah. ghost? Or I uh, I did a year cleaning toilets, or no, I got into night. I was a night cleaner at the mountain. Like everybody, like Eddie. Wall. Yeah, <laughs> it was the best. You would. I started off cleaning toilets, and then the night that was like day cleaner guy. Sorry, and then um, so I was working the day shift. It was shit. And you could ride only weekends. And then the night cleaner was like, I don't, I can't do it. I can't be alone up there. I'm like, what the, f I'm in. Yeah, let's swap out. So you'd shred all day, going at two, work for three hours with a bunch of people. They would leave. Maybe it was three, maybe it was one hour. Anyways, and then I would vacuum the, the carpets. And I found a way to like vacuum them so fast. Me and my buddy Tom Peacock, yeah, buddy. And we were like finished doing it in an hour and then we just play video games for the rest of the night and get paid for 10 hours. So we do that. Uh, anyway, so I got a career away there. I loved it. And, uh, and we were hustling. And, uh, and then uh, it was time to go home. <laughs> so I moved back to, I, by then I met this girl. She was the, anyways, the first love of my life. Boom. I'm going home. And, uh, I tried to get a job at Mont Tremblant, but my French wasn't good enough. So I had to come back and ride the glacier. So I rode back for summer, shred, and uh, yeah, that's it. Like we, that's, we never stopped since then. Let's talk glacier. Who was up there? You're talking Camp of Champions or Craig Kelly? Super well, I was definitely Camp? like, what? It's 95. 96 maybe now i guess 96 so i don't know anybody like we're seeing dev we're seeing rob dow and all those dudes like hitting this jump over here and we're just a couple nerds in the pipe but it was kind of the beginning ish sort of brandon o'dowd was could have been there i don't know if you remember him from shakedown uh there was a crew ben wainwright was there like uh Derek height there was people there and we were just like volunteers in the park maybe salting the pipe and hiking the pipe there's only the pipe, though. Is that like the only feature? There's two jumps, rails? I think, here. There's a couple jumps over here. I don't remember rails. I never really hit rails. And then the camp was over there. And we were all too scared. 
but we were up there shredding. And then there was another camp over there. There's a lot of snow. <laughs> Did you ever go to the because t- uh, um, Craig Kelly had a camp up there? Did you ever go to that one, or is it before your time? No, I never went to camp. No, I sh- I could have. I mean, I it was around. And did you go to Super Pipe Camp right off the bat, or is that a couple years later? Super Pipe Camp starts uh, 99, I think, was the West Beach Classic, the last real West Beach Classic, and Al Clark won it. So I think that was 99, and he took his money and started Super Pipe Camp. So I was just a little nerd shredder still, but I started winning the, uh, I started to meet people, I guess, and like win those like local Sprite series things or whatever. And then I started tr- kind of trying to do contests for a second, cruising around. And then uh, up at Brome, they had this quarter pipe. It was hand dug quarter pipe, like contest. And I was good friends with Shirley and Birdo. And they like got me up there or something. Cause like I didn't know anybody, really didn't. And uh, we were shredding and then we were shredding good, I guess, or whatever. I won one of them. And just kind of kept going from there. And then Super Pipe started and they got me up there like cleaning dishes or something and digging. Oh, and then I started digging the pipe with like Al Clark, Wes Makepeace. Uh, who else is digging? Cashy. I don't I was going to say Trevor, Andrew, but I don't know if he was digging. <laughs> he was right. Yeah. That was but like, like every with like... Tosh Osaka, like there was, you know, Sheen would probably come out and dig. Everybody would have to dig. Like you have to. It's part of the whole mission. Greg Todd's. Uh, so yeah, we just would dig and shred and not shower for eight days, go down, party, come back, shred, shred. It was amazing. And that was the first, that was the first, you know, 22 foot pipe or whatever hand dug. People were boosting everywhere. Travis boosting. Uh, yeah, that was pretty much it. That was Who the start. Who were the standouts? Trev, Al, Kale, Mikey. Mikey was so young. He was probably 13. Friends? Probably, maybe less, 12. I don't know. Damn. And then every once in a while, someone really cool would show up. I remember I was talking to Terry on the phone, and I was like, no way, this is unreal. Like, it was sick. Kev Sansloan came up. Dev was up there a couple of times. They just come for day missions or something. And that was Brome? That was Brome Ridge. So you would go up to Brome and then come down to Squamish and party and then just keep the loop going? No, no, we sleep up there. Oh, what? No, you sl- we slept up there eight-day sessions. So you'd have campers for eight days. You'd coach eat everything's up there go down after eight days come back up and start redig the pipe but you get at least to go down shower and and hit the town how many people are up there at? i bet time? you there's 40 40 people i feel like there was 40 beds okay so like 15 people part of the camp and then like 25 riders yeah maybe like 20 riders something like that 25 you're right something like that Damn. it was doing pretty there was pretty good there was like airport pickups and you know there were a lot of kids but it was a mission. It was, I guess, it was expensive, and uh, yeah, it was tough to keep going. It's too bad. It was fun. That sounds like a really sick era to be a part of. Hand dug too. That's that yeah. in itself is just insane. Yeah. So like, is it just completely like just you find a slope and then you just dig down twenty feet? Yeah, there's tons of snow, and that's they found <laughs> it, and they had a cat, and we just like step it down from the top and then dig it. One time, I got to cut the. You cut the vert, whoever cuts the vert, that's like the start of it. And I remember my my pipe sucked. I fucked it up. It wasn't like horrible, but it yeah, it sucked. It was too tight. You I weren't was, Ben Baluck. I wasn't, no. It, uh, later a, on I was. There's a gift to shaping them. Oh, yeah. Like transition yeah. is fucking hard to shape. Mm-hmm. When you were riding at Super Pipe Camp, you know, living in Whistler now, did you get picked up by somebody quickly? Did you get noticed like a first sponsor kind of happened from Super Pipe Camp or anything? Like oh, that? no, it was or... even before that. It was, uh, it was, um, Rick Johnston. I was living somewhere, and Brendan O'Dowd, who started Empire Shakedown or Empire, even right, and Ryan, and uh, these guys were filming. Brendan was writing for Billabong and Rozzy. And they were filming with this guy, Rick Johnston, who I ended up meeting. And then they invited me out once. And I f- ate shit everywhere. And then we kept going. 
we were hiking all over the place. And uh, the movie came out. And I I guess I'd been winning some contests. Anyways, movie came out, and I remember going to Tommy's to the premiere. I was I flew home, flew back just for it. Yeah, I was like, what's gonna happen? Like I don't know anything. And then the movie's playing, and it's I don't I, there's no rube. I don't see any shots. And then boom, I got closer, and I'm like, what? I, like I didn't know anything back then, but I'm sure it, I felt like it meant something. And like I, all I did was fall all over the place. It was really strange to me because like Dima probably should have had closer. Anyways, that was sweet. And then my buddy Travis Robb, who's a filmer, he used to work with Standard Treetop and stuff. He was rapping for Hammer. And he was like, oh, we we're going to give you and Gabe boards or something. It was like a battle or some Gabe Langlois. So we end up getting the boards or I got a board and then yeah, Rick started filming. Anyways, it was like hammer stuff, but nothing was really happening. I wasn't really like too concerned about it. I'm sure you think about it. You want to get sponsored, but I mean, I got to ride boards for sure. It was fun. And then uh, West Beach Classic happened. Oh, yeah, all throughout Superpipe Camp, I was just riding weird boards. And then uh, 2000 West Beach Classic after like it was cool. Because now it's not cool anymore. Or it wasn't cool in 2000. 99 was like the last awesome year. And then the next year, whatever. I got hooked up by the circle. And Nitro had some boards in there just to demo. And I asked the rep if I could use one of the boards for the contest. And he's like, for sure, let me know how you do. And I was like, I knew he was going to say that. I was like, okay, wicked. So I end up getting second in the big air and f fourth in the pipe. So it was a pretty good weekend. Qualified first. That was cool. With Kyle Clancy, we tied for first. And uh, and I, so I did well. So he's like, okay, I'm going to sponsor you. So Nitro got my hookup through the rep there. And uh, oh, yeah. And then Billabong. And then like people were at calling me. Like West Beach was calling. Or like, what's his name? And the lift line asked me, what's his name? Andy McDonald? Anyways. I was like, whoa. And then Rewind. And from back in the day, and then Billabong. And, I, and then I was riding for Rewind, and then Billabong called me up, and I asked my TM at Rewind. He's like, you got to do it, man. Like, we're going nowhere. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I'm out of here. So it really started that that after that win, or that second place, fourth place, and then, boom, I'm on Nitro, which doesn't say much. Like, I was just getting boards. Billabong, some budget, I'm sure. And then uh, we started really filming. Oh, man, you know what? Like, we are already filming. Who were the standouts at West Beach Classics back in the day? You well, when, there was, when, was when it was in the village, it was like, you know, Browner. Uh, uh, Annie was going. That's when Annie first came in. But that was like 99 when it was in the village or 98. 90, yeah, 90, 99 was the pipe was up top. Like, everybody was here. You name it. Every pro. Todd Richards, like. Everybody was coming for West Beach Classic. You don't remember this? You're too young. It's before my time. I know now because I yeah. know the history a bit. Yeah. But it's everybody's like... there. You name it, they're there. Jamil Connor. I think he passed away. That guy. Trev was just coming out. Like Trev's gonna sign this huge contract with Burton. Like it was a big talk. And uh, and uh, and then the following year, 2000, it was more local. Like you know, no one came. Sansalone won. I think Sansalone won in '98 as well. But Sansalon won, I got second. But the names weren't there, you know? It wasn't just like... Wait. It wasn't like Todd Richards no, and there, Peter No, there was Lyon. no one there anymore. It was like me, Gilbert, you know, the Frenchies. It wasn't the American roster. What was the downfall of, like, everyone coming? I don't know what happened there. West Beach, I don't know. Um, I wasn't in the loop. But it just stopped being wicked. What did you get second with? What was your trick? Back seven? <laughs> I thought you were going to say the other one. What? Front side three nose grab? Back, uh, back one. <laughs> Sansalone on the hike. I'm like, I don't have, like, I didn't have a big bag of tricks. And he's like, you got to do something big, man, if you're going to win. I think he called me Gabe. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, man, what am I going to do? I already did a seven. Like, I got nothing else, really. And it's a weird jump. So I just was like, oh, I'll go backside 180 as big as I can go. And I just like back one Japan. And I went huge. And somehow I landed it. 
And then I heard Brad Baxter. We weren't friends. And he's like, man, I can't believe a Baxter 180 is going to win this thing. And I was like, no way. This is wicked. <laughs> <laughs> and then that I got, would never happen now. Yeah. And then I got a second. And... Uh, well, kudos to the judges for giving you a, a W there with a back 180 Japan. That is, that is dope. Kev did like a seven, uh, like a, some kind of rodeo seven twenty or something. So, treetop. When how did they get kind of enrolled into the whole shindig? Because they were around yeah. the, this, yeah. during this whole time, yeah. but you yeah. weren't a part. Uh, of so it. I was pretty much friends with all those dudes from Superpipe camps, kind of coming up, like Sheen and Kale and everybody was there. So I was like, you want to shoot with the treetop if you can. And like I was filming with my buddy Mike and this little French crew and trying to do our own thing, whatever. And uh, and Rick, we did a, a, a movie with him. But anyways, So you try to go with treetop. And then I'm on Nitro and Nitro sponsors treetop. Can and I that, pause you for one yeah, second? Yeah, go ahead. Was treetop like a... More modern day, like Sandbox or Alterna or something. No, like that. it was treetop a step was like above. A step like I would say, treetop was like up there with Mac Dog. Damn. Well, maybe I'm crazy, but no, like those guys pioneered everything, like snowmobiling, all the everything. So, what? like to me, maybe because we're living in Whistler, but like you got Lucas Huffman's in there at the beginning. You got Sheen. You got everybody from the beginning. Kale. Totally. Browner. Trev, Jonathan Moore. Jonathan. Yeah. So like, yeah, they changed it. It was a different style to like the music and whatnot. It was. It I was mean, the, the early treetop then, editing was... was insane. It's like all to, um, what's his name's uh, music, and it's like yeah, Matthew Alien. Matthew Alien, who's like the sickest, but it's like yeah. it's hard to me watching them now. It's like hard to like the editing and the music. And the riding, for whatever reason, maybe because I'm from Winnipeg, didn't really ever sink and like yeah. captivate me. There's like a storyline. It was like they were really, they were something else in my mind. The yeah. riding was insane yeah. though. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Next level. Like the last one, what was it called? Third Degree Burns? Yeah, Tyson's third part, degree. insane. High speed spinning. Shandy, everybody's ripping. Lucas is ripping. And then they had a, like a falling out there. At some point, uh, I guess, like Brad and Curtis with the other guy, Steve, and it kind of just disbanded and kind of fell apart or something. Rick had, Johnston had been filming with them. So when it kind of started to fall apart, Rick came in and brought us in and changed it again. It's kind of, it was kind of like a West Beach classic 99 <laughs> to, uh, you know what I mean? It was just different. Like it's me and Osichuk and Mike Turner and like just a bunch of little nerds yeah whereas before it was like you know pros yeah the so pro rick brought us in and and we did uh foreplay gilbert was in there and when it was a totally different style rick's a full-on clown he's always trying to joke around it was a different style completely from the og original one and it was good but like yeah i don't know what what happened there People just stopped watching. I have no idea, actually. Maybe it did well. Maybe it was good. I don't know. <laughs> but he did. You got opener in 2002, the main event, and then you got Ender in 2003, and then in Bam, you got Ender too. So it's like you're yeah, kind of like play. I got Ender too. So you got like. But that's because Rick likes me. Three, yeah, but you also had good footage. Yeah, there was like, decent. So three, four years in a row of opener, ender, how did, you know, you're on Nitro, you said, you got on Billabong, like at this point, like you're filming. I'm still getting nothing, right? I'm still really getting nothing, but uh, Fuck. But we're filming and and I'm getting my Nitro gear, Sheen's giving me some boots once in a while, and then like my ender in that foreplay movie, like I, I wasn't good at snowboarding, still, like I wasn't, there was something missing, like Mike Turner can do, could do everything. Like he was ripping, I got lucky, or like I had to work really hard. He was ripping. You know what I mean? I do. Something was just weird. Like I could see it was there, but it wasn't yet. I was still confused. So, anyways, I don't know why I said that, but that's why that maybe that movie didn't feel good to me, or something was off. I didn't. No, I like that. I've definitely been in that shoe before, where it's yeah. like you feel like you're good, but it hasn't clicked yet. And yeah, I've yeah. had years where it like clicks, where it's like yeah, yeah. you go from like 
level yeah. five to like level eight yeah. quick and you're yeah. like whoa it just uh, unfolded yeah, yeah. easily the, the the whole beginning of it all actually was third degree burns there was a wild card spot and it was like i was on nitro and tyson carmody was on nitro tyson's amazing i suck and i was at max fish and travis rob pulls me aside because he was filming them he's like dude you need some more tricks and i'm like okay okay so i went and hopped on my snowmobile and hiked with kevin slack i'm pretty sure mike was there too hard and we started learning how to spin cab switch or whatever you want to call it and so that year whatever the hell that year was we started i didn't make the wild card spot tyson killed it and turned he was amazing pro or whatever on nitro and so i had to do another year elsewhere which was rick and foreplay which i was still i remember there's a cab seven in that shot and it's so bad and I actually asked Rick to put it in there because, like, I, I didn't have tricks. Like, there's a back seven in there that was whack. And I was like, oh, idiot. Anyways, the following year, it clicked. I don't know what the hell happened. But that was, like, my... To me, like, I could do any trick I wanted or something for, for the main event. Or my cab spins turned on. Like, I, there was a cab seven in there. And then uh, some switchback stuff that wasn't landing, so that's fine. Um, straight up, I feel like if I can intervene for a second here, I feel like those younger years, you just don't have all the know-how of how to ride the backcountry. And then there's one year where the start of the year goes well, like you're riding well. And then your confidence just goes from like being like kind of confident to like, no, I'm fully capable of hanging. And it's weird that I'll go through like a point of this in the season where it's like, I'm just not getting clips, and it just spirals to me not getting clips. Yeah, you're, it stays in your mind. And it and you're stays saying, in your done, mind, I'm and done. it just I'm fucking done. eats you. And then, like, out of nowhere, you start, like, landing, and then you land a trick that you're not that good at, and then you get to where you're at, and, like, bam, and you're like, I can do anything. Which, like, that yeah. part is really fucking sick. And also, the crew really matters as well. Or Like, even the third-degree burns... Like, I didn't know really anybody. I wasn't, like, super tight. I'm not calling people. Hey, what up? You know, hey, Ruby, coming out today. Okay, I just learned how to sled. I got stuck. They're gone. You know, you just feel like a loser, and you're not going to snowboard well when you feel like a loser or whatever. Like, I'm tired. I just dug, like, I'm done. Look at Trev. Nice life. Like, whatever. So that didn't work out. And even foreplay was, yeah, still trying to figure it out. But you're with your homies, and you're, like, maybe... You know, you just ride better with your friends. That's what I found. I also feel like it was like most likely kind of cutthroat if you weren't like a good sledder and you couldn't hang back then and you were the new kid. Oh, yeah. It was like buckle up and figure it out. Oh, yeah. Because those, yeah, yeah, for sure. I still don't know how. <laughs> how did you make it through that if you, you said like, the early rube, you said your mom was saying that you were really soft. Then you get into s- snowboarding, which is like so far from soft. And then you get into sledding and yeah. snowboarding, which is like you're basically Dude, I was terrified. Navy SEAL. <laughs> I, I, I remember the like I was so scared I missed this story, but I was so afraid of heights. Like I, I remember uh, going around the waterfall. It's like, oh, I got lost or whatever. Uh, and then the first cliff I ever dropped was in Revelstoke. And we were on top. I didn't even know what was happening, but I just went off, closed my eyes. <laughs> I just closed my eyes and fell, landed, and smashed my face with my knee. I looked up and I'm like, whoa, no way I did that. <laughs> what? But I was fully eyes closed, don't remember anything. Like I Your first know. cliff that you jumped off, you closed your eyes, yes. kneed yourself in the face, and you were stoked because you landed it. I, I, I Well, I didn't land it, but I lived. And I looked up <laughs> and I was like, I remember uh, crying, not crying, but close, like sledding. I fell behind. I was a little turd, like, and my thumb hurt so much. They were gone. Like, I didn't know where anybody was. Like, anyways, I was terrified. And now, yeah, now we have to sled with all these big dogs. Well, you're definitely on something to prove when you're filming with Bam. Because, I mean, I watched all your parts before this, and you have, like, big stuff. But bam, it's like you can really see that you want to hang with the Whistler best of the best at the time, whether it's Devin or JF or Sansalone or Sheen or. That was Rick. 
who, whoever. It just seemed like something. Like you yeah. guys were hitting big yeah. shit. Rick made us do everything. We were doing. We were hitting jumps that without looking at the land, like at the landing, we'd go up, look at something, and Rick would say, "Go off there, yeah." And you couldn't see, but we wouldn't go look. We just trust Rick. It was crazy. I remember it. It was nuts. But and, like, was it? Good trust in the sense yeah, where yeah. like he was squaring you up to yeah. something that worked yeah. or like deadly we were, trust. He had a good eye. There was some different stuff we were hitting. Not different, but like their mother. Well, that was Tyson actually. But this other one, it's in my part. It's a weird ass landing. It's there next to like Dev does a switchback five off it. It's at the bottom. Gas drops here and you go down. It's on the left. It's a step down. I think I know. I know. The Dev scene. does a switchback seven or is that off the other gas drop? I think the one I'm thinking about, Dev has a cover of a switchback. And it's down lower. Thing. It's not a gas drop. I th- always thought it was gas drop. We'll have to look. Yeah. There's two there. There's a diving board. There's gas drop, and then there's a diving board down low here. That's my cab nine and bam. That shot's sick. And I think someone, Dave Short, goes over like everything. Anyways. Let's let's touch on Mother, though. You know, you, you're there with Tyson and Rick. You know, that's one of the most infamous jumps in Whistler. Ben Ferguson and Red just put a clinic on it. I had Sean Miskam in on the last episode. He just front three did. I mean, Devin's iconic switchback fives on it. Renzi cab nines it and cab threes it. The list, I mean, the list goes yeah, on yeah. and on. Sollers and Rusty. But you and Tyson pioneered this. Well, Tyson <laughs> had the, yeah. Was, did he guinea it? Yes. Oh. Right? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he found it. He's like, hey, let's go check out this one. And we roll up and I'm just like, no way. Like, I think it's early season two. It's terrifying it's big and th- we were going off the top not we weren't we weren't smart like you guys are hitting it sideways which makes sense with that tranny like it's pretty flat if you go yeah we went off the top but at the same time it was like in those shots it was like speedy or tyson's so big it doesn't look that big or something but when i hit it i could fucking kill myself but it was big i was terrified you know what you're up there you're like are you guys just chucking snowballs off it being like, I think that's the speed. Cause I'm comparing it to, we went there with Sean, we build it and we're not doing mother. We're doing stepmother, but you know, same kind of thing. Um, and Matt and Rusty and Rasmin are there who have all hit it. And they kind of line Sean up and they go, you drop from here, you go straight and then you'll make it. You know, it's you and Tyson up there blowing around in the wind. <laughs> and Rick's like, I think you got it, but no yeah. one's ever hit I don't this. remember it, but Tyson was so good. Like, he just made, called all the shots. Like, this is where we're going. And sure enough, it was perfect. And he landed probably first try, right? Did he? I don't know. Front five. He front fived it's it. It's in his part, man. Damn. Right? Yeah, it's in his part. And Turner got the back three. Oh, almost did something. And. I blasted my face right off the bat. What did you do? Front seven, and that was it. Front seven. Oh yeah, and you knew yourself in the face. You're wearing the white jacket. And I was like, oh, I can't go back. <laughs> and then those guys maybe hit a couple more times, and then we never went back till years, years, years later. What do you do when you go back years later? Idiot. Rick calls me, and he's like, I went up there with Ian McIntosh. He hit it once. Didn't even build the jump. There's tons of landing left. I'm like. By then, I, like I, I'm done. I'm tired. What year is this? Just it's for- the end. It's close, <laughs> and we go out there. I'm pretty sure it was Brendan Keenan, Rusty, and uh, Pedersen, maybe. And like we go up there. Sure enough, Macintosh went left, so I can't go left. I can go right, and I'm like, has anybody back one eighty this thing, idiot? And I, those guys said they're out. And I'm like, I jump. Oh, yeah, Evan was there taking photos. And I'm like, in the air, I wish I grabbed my board. I didn't, damn it. But, like, I thought I was going to land it. You're going West Beach class. I'm like, oh, my God. This is, and then I saw the landing coming. I'm like, oh, my, I'm dead. So I punished myself. And I'll ne- that's the end of it. So you got completely demoed on it. Yeah, not like horrible. I still lived, but <laughs> <laughs> but like it what off the top. No, and it's yeah, it's crazy. I spoke to Rick actually before we recorded here, and Rick actually quote said that that. Well, he actually didn't say that he was telling you to jump off anything. He said that Rube 
would jump off anything that I thought he could jump off of. Yeah. He was like, Rube was fearless. And I and now hearing your kind of demeanor, like you're kind of this passive kid, a little bit shy. Rick's probably a little bit more like alpha vibes. He's probably like, you should jump off that. You're like, for sure. <laughs> Okay. He, he 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 had a point a good point he was like you, you got to go big you want to be the you want to make it or what like we can't we can't be little bitches like and did you so everything we tried wasn't like a little bitch sorry am i allowed to say that yeah fuck yeah well, yeah live a little yeah you're being you're not trying to yeah. be soft you're like, trying yeah to let's fucking clips. do this like i yeah anyways you get bitter if you want some I remember going out and being like, "What are we doing? This is ridiculous!" Like we did this is you know. Well, you, you either go full blast or not. I guess. Well, and, and I mean, you. That era was like, go big. Yeah. And we've ta- I've talked about it before on the podcast a lot, but it's like, jump size since that era has not increased. It's like, like you guys are hitting some big ones. Yeah, I mean. Different stuff, but there's still bigness. Yeah, there's still bigness. Yeah, I mean, I will give a props to like uh, Rasmin and our crew. I don't want to say that Dude, I'm the big there's jumper. Big in the crew, ones. But... What do you mean? Like, look at Sage and that crew. Like, and all. There's some big jumps going on. Yeah, but they're like they're big. But like, if you think of like when Mother, perfect jump, Chad's gap, like the biggest mm. jumps got unlocked. It's all around that 2005 era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even earlier. And then, earlier. Yeah, earlier. And it's like it those do. are still considered yeah. like the biggest jumps yeah. in snowboarding. I'm not going to say that like someone like Sage or Red or Ferg or McMorris or Rasmin yeah, yeah, yeah. or the big jumpers aren't going like huge. They still are. Or the generation before like Renzi and UC and Ika and stuff like that. Like, yeah, of course, going fucking massive. But like it's never really it's gotten to a point where it's like, does it get bigger or does it just. Like maybe you can find it. I'm sure Travis would do it. Or maybe I would like. I just want to see somebody hit like maybe just for the show, like a perfect jump 2.0, but it's like 60 feet bigger. It's like, does anybody want to hit that? Would anybody hit it? Like, yeah, it's probably hard to find. <laughs> totally. I mean, and uh, and scary to Guinea because, I mean, yeah, like Tyson just figuring out the speed. Like you have to be kind of a wizard. That's oh, the that's really the unlock good. is being able to f- navigate speed off it, off things. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That was a tough one. Especially if you yeah, because I I ollie I'm an ollie dude, so I have to go a little slower. Anyways, you get confused. Who you- were your influences back then? Because when I look at you, I think of like insanely sick trick selection, really good tweaks, and pop so like who were your guys that kind of or girls or whatever like inspired you to like fucking snowboard the way you were riding brushy for sure terrier for sure who else back then it was terrier brushy for sure brushy and like that's 80 something right Who are the other kids like around your era that like, you know, that were like on the same tier, whether or not they're getting paid more, but you guys were all out there like hustling. Like I look at myself right now and you would compare yourself to like Ejack or Ben Ferg or something like that because you're you're both doing the same thing. I was so late in the game, dude. I didn't turn pro till 26. Oh, that is late for back then. Yeah. Like West Beach Classic 2000. What am I? 24. Dang. So I'm 24. I'm West Beach Classic nerd. Then I get sponsored, kind of, get some gear. Then I have a video part. And then I, uh, who am I shredding with? It's my homies. Did you get put, uh, did anyone put in your head, like, fuck, you're too old? Like, you should wrap it up? No, no, because I, I probably look like a baby. But, like, we were shredding. And then and I, I uh, who are we hanging, looking up to? It was probably, like, the Frenchies, Pelshat, Dev and all them. But I remember someone asked me this the other day, and I was like, this person. Who the hell was it? I don't know. Gigi. Nicholas. No. DCP. No. Um, Roman. I'm just trying to think. I really him. dig Roman. After, like, that guy just charges. I love all his shit. Or, like, definitely whatever movie, Saturation, Vivid. Oh, it's like, Vivid. He's such an insane. animal. Like, 
I love that he worked with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ruben yeah, Roman was like a while. my one of my yeah. Roman was a, one of my faves. Solberg had some wicked style. Who is the other human? I don't. I want to throw out random names, but I don't feel like I'm going to land on it. Freddie Kelberman. <laughs> no. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going to be right. Hakey Sorsa. Lucas Huffman, too. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Trev, amazing. Yeah, Trev's style is so Trev was sweet. great, man. Yeah. I met Trev. Trev. Trevor has his grandparents live in my hometown back in the day. So I met Trevor when he was probably 13, skating through the streets, maybe even younger. Oh, yeah. And it was cool to like get to film 20 years later with him. Anyways. But yeah, Trev, great style. Uh, who was in the 1999? Like Maury, Browner, K Kevin Young. Oh, dude, Kevin Young was sick. Uh, you know, that world. Yeah. Scotty Whitlake. Said, oh, Whitlake was fucking the best. Yeah. Those are good names. Uh, Rick Johnson, your filmer, on that same call was saying something. Well, a story about you going to Super Park and that you were two days late and you hit a massive jump that you had no idea that nobody hit yet and you front threed it then you went straight to the woods and puked everywhere. Do you recall? So Rick's stories are a little blown out, a little weird, but I don't know how we're two days late. But maybe we were a day late. And... Uh, no, I don't know about this big jump, but there was a big jump that Travis hit first and then Turner and then me. But we were definitely like jumping on the big jumps and we were really hungover. <laughs> and I probably did vomit in the woods <laughs> once. Kids know how did our kids know? How did you kind of get incorporated with that after the the whole whistler? Because you're well, so whistler. OK, it seems like. so so what really happened was uh, I remember freaking out saying, man, my boots are thrashed. My gear's thrashed. Like I need, I'm getting some boards from the rep, but I'm not getting anything else. And Tyson's like, dude, just ask. And, I, and I'm like, really? I'm too scared. But so I end up asking, but maybe I think I wrote like, man, I'm busting my ass out here and I'm wearing Sheen's fucking boots to the, the TM and his name was Chris Cooster. And uh, he's like, sure thing, boss or whatever. And sends me a bunch of gear. And then, oh man, and sends me a bunch of gear. So it's feeling, I'm feeling better. And, uh, and then they, a, a rider, a German rider comes out. Uh, this guy, Andy Lehman, super awesome. We shred for a week. We have some fun. And he thinks I should, he's like, you got to come to the nitro camp in Germany. And I keep asking the Canadian people like, Hey, can I get there? And they're just not responding or don't really care, whatever it is. And I just make this stupid joke because I'm an idiot. And I say some weird stuff or funny. Well, I don't know if it's whatever. I don't think. And I said some message because I'm Jewish. Anyways, I'm half Jew. It doesn't matter. But like I wrote this stupid email to Andy as a joke. And he like wasn't stoked on it and showed it to the owners of Nitro, Seth and Tommy or something. And then I get, I'm like, oh, wow, well, I guess I'm done. <laughs> and then. Sheen, yeah, Sheen writes me an email back then because it's whatever. And he's like, what the hell did you do, man? Like, everybody's talking about this email. And I'm like, what did I do? I'm done. I'm not going to the camp. It's over for me. And then Foreplay comes out. And then the next year, the owners invite me to Seattle to the office with Tyson. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I get to go to the Nitro head office in Seattle with the boys and I, my part sucks in my brain still. Like, I don't like it. That cab seven is just whatever. I know that's not me or something. And uh, I remember meeting Seth and he's like, oh, so you're Rube. He's German, I'm pretty sure. And I'm like, oh. anyways, it was great. And they'd like put me on the team, probably the AM team. There was like an AM team to start. It was me, maybe Gilbert was a little later. But there was a couple dudes there, so I'm in. Now I'm in. Now I'm getting like some gear and maybe some travel. And uh, and then the following year was the main event. And that's by far one of my better parts. And they got to keep all the footage and they put it in their team movie. And that's the one. It was really good. Or I, I've never saw it, but people said it was really good. And then they were like, okay, you're going on the pro team. So it was like me... 
Huffman, Mark Frank. Like, it was a sick, sick team. And I'm in there. And, like, I'm going to Vegas. And there's a poster with my head on it. Like, it was amazing. And uh, so I filmed for that. And then, and then they were like, okay, we're going to put you in uh, the People movie. Neo Proto. Remember Neo Proto? Oh, yeah. Pierre's films. Pierre and Justin. And I'm super terrified because I don't know. Like, I don't even know if I'm good. I'm good with my homies, but I'm super awkward and socially fucking who knows. I don't know what I'm doing. But they're like, hey, you're going to film with this crew. And I'm shitting my pants. And Rick's bummed because he wants me to keep filming with him. And... I remember the first time I like fly to California and Tidor, Sean Tidor picks me up at the airport. He had blown his knee maybe or something. So he was our new team manager. Tonino was doing something else. He was just temporary TM and he picked me up and we went out to, to team challenge. Right. And I got to know people. And then I was going to have to film with like, I went to just, I don't even know whose house it was, but like Whitlake's on the couch. Everybody's there. I'm fucking terrified. And these guys are hitting handrails. And I'm like trying to feel good about hanging with everybody. Like we didn't do anything, man, when I was there. It was weird to me. Like, don't they know that you're a whistler backcountry yeah, jumper? for sure. For sure. We could have done it. But I, I didn't understand like how it kind of worked. Like I was saying, hey, Green, I, I was like, Greener, you should come hang with us. We're going to. Nitro spawn. We can just hang out. Like I didn't really know anything. I thought it was cool to just bring your homies. I'm going filming with these guys, and yeah, like we're going to hit a handrail. I'm sitting that one out. I'm not over here. We did this thing. I'm like, man, like I don't even know. I gotta go. I just left, and I went home and I filmed with Rick, and that was the year of Bam, and I had like wicked shots with Rick, but I had nothing with those dudes, and it was like they were filming digital. Rick was still filming 16, so like giving them shots was weird too. It just looked like I wasn't part of the gang. That's how I saw it. I was like, man, I just don't feel good. So my snowboarding was shit too. But when I was wrecked, it was, it was weird. It was a mind game. Like I remember after team challenge, we stayed or something went to North star and I didn't even know how to hit a jump. I couldn't even do a slash on the top of the half pipe wall. I don't know, dude. That's how I know I'm insane. And it goes way back. Anyway, so so that was P, uh, Neo Proto, a couple shots in there. I wish I could see them and just be disappointed. But then the next year was another one. Maybe it was, what did you call Burning it? Burning Bridges? Burning Bridges. Same idea. Oh, yeah, it was the next year. Same idea. Just like, what? I couldn't land anything. It was something was just off again. Like I couldn't. My was mind, the crew nice to you and stuff? Crew was great. Crew was amazing. Actually, that year of was burning bridges was oh, well. Look, at it. it was amazing. But like, who's in here? Eric Christensen, like the best. Andy Forgash, the best. Cooley, the best. Like Michael LeBlanc, I didn't get to know him, but he's the best. Hebel didn't. Really, Mendenhall, amazing. Daryl, awesome. Gilby, Rube. Old people, Crawford, amazing. Like, the crew was good, but it was, like, we had no snow that year. We had to drive down and sleep on floors, like, boom. Next thing you know, I'm at the casino playing poker till 7 in the morning, missing days out with Mark Frank and Gilby, like an idiot. Like, I blew it, you know? I just didn't really fucking care. <laughs> I did and I didn't, but, like, I didn't know it was going to be sunny. What are you going to do? <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> And then I'd go home and shoot with Rick and get shots. Ah, man, I can't explain it. It could have been the polka dot board, guys. It could have been that polka dot board. There was something off with it. I couldn't land. So, like, you're not landing, but then on days that are maybes, you're at a casino gambling till seven. Do you regret that decision? Not really. <laughs> yes. No, like, I don't. Because, like, snowboarding, to me, knowing what I know now, it wasn't a job to me like when i have a job i do my best like i was a sick junkie sand trap raker greens cutter like i was the fastest at everything cleaning the like i try to be efficient at everything with snowboarding like i didn't i obviously didn't treat it as a job or i'd still be going 
You know, like you guys are going for a long time. Look at Rusty. Like, well, he's as done, soon as I but... stopped having fun, I was out. And I stopped having fun. What was the catalyst for you? Just when did you stop having fun and why? See, I'm trying to remember when uh, Sand Sloan did start. When I started filming with Sandbox, was yeah. that like late? That was after 2007 or yeah, before? yeah, totally. It was. I think so. Yeah. I think that like it was. When I look at your era, it's like you know you're filming for main event, foreplay, bam, and then you go for bam to uh, Kid Snow and Neo Proto, that whole world. Burning yeah, Bridges. a couple of those. Yeah, and then White Out. So, so I think like after Neo Proto stuff, after Bam, uh, Nitro wanted me to do the Burning Bridges. Hostinick actually called me. That was the coolest thing in the world. Like left a thing on my answering machine. Like, hey, me and Coulter think you should come ride with us. And I'm like, no way. Pelshat wants me to ride with or do uh, whiteout stuff. Because like the teaser came out and I had like tons of wicked shots. So there was kind of some hype which freaked me out because I don't think I could hang. Like, there's no way I'm going out with Hostinick and those guys and feeling like a good snowboarder. You know, I just lost something happened inside my stomach. <laughs> and like, you second guessed yourself too much. I mean, I'll come back to this. But yeah, like something was off. And then Rick started stopped filming. And that made it off. He sh made a horrible movie. Sorry, Rick. Antebellum was like the worst thing he's ever done. Sorry, bud. But like, it wasn't, it was just horrible. It made, gave me, made me sick. My video part, everything just, ugh, what? Like, why would you, I can't even put that out. I don't want people to see this, you know? Something happened. And, uh, and then the money stopped. Or like, you saw the reversal. It was like, oh, here's your peak. Boom. Okay, you're not gonna you're gonna go to the casino till fucking seven in the morning, buddy. Here you go. Not that it was crazy, and I expected it too. I'm like, Pfft. I'm like, all right, there's the top, I guess. And like, there's the top, I guess. Unless I like have an amazing, and I maybe I just started doubting everything. Uh, and then uh, luckily, like Kev says, come film with us, and it was fun. I got to hang with all you guys, my homies, and I had some fun parts, and still making a little bit of money, slowly trickling down to nothing. And then we were going out to the Hurley. Oh my God, It's this is actually later, isn't it? We were going out to the Hurley. Yeah, it's 2010, son of a bitch. Uh, it was 3.30 in the morning, woke up in White Gold and drove out to the gas station, Petrocan. It's now 4 in the morning, 4.30. I know we're going to hit the Hurley road gap. I don't want to hit it because my mind is a mess. And I think I have way too much pop and I'm going to go slow and land on the road. Like I'm putting it out there already, you know? And then as we're gassing up, we see JP Walker drive by 4.30 in the morning. Oh my God. That's, that's, you know, what are you, where's he going? So we like <laughs> fill it up, jump in the truck. We're behind now. Like, oh, we're screwed. It's fucking four in the morning. We're screwed. We're late. Like we can't even hit this jump now. Thank God in my brain. Park, walk up to JP. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> and he's like, hitting the road gap. I'm like, no way. I'm like, we got to get up at like two in the morning to come hit the road gap. And he's like, 2010, son. And I'm like, what? I'm out of here. I remember, I'm like, I'm done. I hop in the truck. I drive back to Wiss. I go in the park, totally exhausted and almost hurt myself. I'm like, I'm fucking done. Like waking up at two in the morning to go see the stupid jump. Barely getting paid anymore. And that was it. So 2010 was the end of that brain of like trying to do the f filming and like, what's the point? I probably still had a little paycheck. But. It seems like when you're a young kid, it's not the paycheck. You just want to be a professional snowboarder for whatever reason. It's like it's just like this yeah. goal in the horizon that you're like, I'm chasing that. And I don't even know what it is. Then when you're really close to it, you start hearing about people making money and then you compare your riding to money and then you're like, I should be making this kind of money. And that's where it all goes Not fucking me. wrong. I never in it for one second thought about money. That's genius. I, I never when I got a, my first contract, I was like, what the fuck? Like, this is great and I'm going to get what I deserve and that's it. And if I'm going to deserve more, I'm going to, it's going to, I'm going to see it in my contract. I'm not going to ask for any more. I'm not going to ask for anything. See, that's interesting that you brought that up. Cause I spoke to a bunch of people before this episode 
Brian, Austin, Sheen, uh, Sansloan, Rusty, and there was some sort of consensus among that group where it just seems like you never really asked for really too much, but then you never got anything. But then Sheen put it really good where he's like, I don't think Rube ever wanted the added pressure that if he was getting paid a lot that the money would come with like because then he would have way more expectation where if he didn't ask for possible. too too much then it, then they weren't expecting too much and then it just seemed like i don't know yeah i i always i always believe you get what you deserve like that's but i feel i i i think that's a double-edged sword because i feel like you need to kind of ask for it too like yeah but just let your writing speak for itself boom you're in done like i i don't know if you're worth it you're worth it if you're not, I mean, if you think you're more, go for it more. I didn't think I was worth it anymore. Like, I couldn't believe I was getting what I was getting. Wicked. And then when you get to the top and it sort of starts to crumble, you're like, okay, I'm on my way out. Like, what am I going to do? Go to the casino. Go to the casino. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then, uh, yeah, like, I never asked Billabong for, I remember once maybe asked Billabong, I was like, really, is that it? And he's like, yeah, take it or leave it. Thanks, rest of your cocktail. And, uh, but like, yeah, I, whatever I deserved, I got, and man, I'm very thankful for all of it. Cause I didn't work for a couple of years, some years. I'm looking back at all your video parts. I think that you were deserving of much more. And I think that judging on what you said previously about you going into these, uh, more American video projects like Neo Proto and Kid Snow kids i don't know why i keep saying kids know kids know um you were second guessing yourself you sure. didn't think that you were that sick you For didn't sure. think that you so, but like you watch your old video parts and i think that you're fucking insane you were so were good like you you had the the like i already went over this but you had the pop the tweaks and the trick selection and at that point i watched all those old videos there was a few people that really stood out in all those movies and you were one of them because People were just starting to learn in that you had Jeff Brushy who was going smaller because that's what they were doing back then because they were pioneering everything, but they nailed style. But then people started going big and kind of risking their style to go big. And then you were part of the generation that was figuring out how to go big with style. And you were one of those early young Groms on the come up that could do exactly that. Like the Trevor Andrews, the Mikey Rences, like part of that group of like Tyson, whatever, Mike Turner, people yeah, who had yeah. like good style. I think that style matters. I think that's all I think about. If it's not going to be look good, then what's the fucking point? Really? To I, I, I agree. I, I just, just think that you were kind of among. It would those. have been cool to get more comfortable with, with the world of it all, which I, you know, maybe, maybe I was, but yeah, like I said, I just didn't treat it as a job. I just had fun. I couldn't believe it. Like, here we go. I'm going traveling everywhere. Like, what? You're flying me to Switzerland? Really? I love your approach, though. I do. Like, I'm arguing for you. It's similar to how I think of, like, E-Man snowboarding. Whenever I, I get so frustrated because I just wanted him to, like, get more out of it. But it's like, that was never what he wanted. And that's never that's been his I, goal. Oh, yeah. That's my top E-Man, too. He's in the list. Shredder. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, like ugh. anyone who's ridden with E-Man firsthand yeah. would would say that it's yeah. just like a gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he has a gift that's uh, he's the best style ever. Yeah, you're never gonna stop snowboarding. I'll never stop snowboarding. Nothing has ever changed. Nothing has changed since the day I started in my brain. Like as far as everything, still to this day, is to make sure I get to snowboard in the winter. And if I'm not gonna snowboard in the winter, I'm gonna be a miserable fuck. So many people snowboard love it start getting paid the professional snowboarding career ends no more paycheck they stop some people stop does that yeah. surprise you because it's like you got you stopped getting paid but then you started doing contests even more it seemed like you're doing uh, no but those are easy or not easy but what they're do you fun. mean you're doing but they're huge like fun. hip contests but they're fun but they're yeah, fun. buddy you're doing like <laughs> fucking yeah, 30 really foot. like there's no way i'm winning so it's just for fun you did win some of them Border styles, border styles with Terrier yeah, and Terrier. <laughs> no, but yeah, after the after whatever that was, 2010, it's all fun. And I can race. I'm fast or I go to bank slot, whatever. I think I'm giving you the gears because 
I'm the same way a little bit. Like, I feel like I often undermine myself and my closest friends are like, you need to stop doing that. It's just like not healthy to think that sure. what you're doing on your snowboarding on your snowboard isn't sick because it's it's just not you don't get better that way similar to your like bam year i'm imagining you're like i'm fucking good like, oh yeah i can fucking hang no i knew then you go into neo proto and have a couple bad video parts you get in your head you're like i'm going to the fucking casino i'm not gonna land tomorrow anyway nice <laughs> yeah it's exactly it it's probably it for sure Whatever, you got to be impeccable with your word, right, Jody? <laughs> Rule number one. What was your headspace going into Sandbox? You start filming with them. It's like you're going from filming with like Whiteout and like these huge productions with the best snowboarders in the world. And then you're filming with Mikey Pedersen, Jeeves, Rusty, myself, Griffin, Sollers, when we're all like kids. Did you kind of like moving into... It was fun. Because I didn't really... Yeah, yeah, I had more fun hanging with my friends. Like, I didn't care to have shot. Like, I didn't need shot. I wasn't there. You know, I'm just hanging and I'm getting shots and it's fun. So at this point, snowboarding was just a pure passion project for you, yeah. which is amazing because you're going out and sledding and filming and on legit shit still, but you're just doing it for fun. I mean, I'm sure I'm getting a little paycheck, but I'd rather like go out. Yeah, I had fun. I had f I was having fun just like we were having fun with Rick. Like we we're always having a good time. When you're having a good time, you're getting shots. When you're not, you're, it sucks. Yeah, I feel like you're everything. You started filming with Sandbox again. For me as a young kid, I see you really incorporated in the snowboard community. You're at all the premieres. You're riding more than anybody on the hill. You're attending all of the events, whether it's the Monster Shred Shows or whatever, Border Styles, anything around the area. The Baker Bank Slaloms, like you're attending those events. You're about it. You're no longer really doing it for like this paycheck anymore. But to me, as a young kid who just moved to Whistler, it almost seemed like a re-up on your career. And I felt like there was there was some momentum building behind your name again. And then, I mean, I then we got that cover. Yeah. And then you got a cover. Yeah, with it was Parker. like more fun. You're just like shredding for fun. You're shredding well. And like, you know, camp is fun and you're getting shots on the hip and you're going to Baker and doing well. Like no one, I don't really, you know. It was just all for fun. So you're having fun and you're riding well. What makes you enjoy being around like the like snowboarding and snowboard community? Because you're not snowboarding by yourself, you know, million dollar ridge laps solo. Just no, no. like you, you're somebody who I would say enjoys being involved in the community and hanging out with like that group of friends like during it's fun. the whole winter. It's fun for sure. But I mean, nowadays is a little different. It's definitely slower because I live in Pemberton, but like. I love shredding. Like I love shredding with my homies. I love going full blast all day long. Like you just keep having fun and you're gonna stay young. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna have a beer. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, basically where I was gonna take that is the baby mama drama kind of This happens. is early. Or is is it too early still? No, no, but like we've you know We've covered the shredding. We've covered the downfall. Oh, yeah. Okay. You want to go full downfall? Full downfall. Full fall. So we downfall. go, what? This is burning bridges. We got some white out. Uh, the paychecks dwindling. Contracts are dis, you know, there, but yeah, not really. Do you actually genuinely not care when they're dwindling? But, or do you feel like. I don't care. Okay. You get what you deserve. I remember the last year was uh, Mendenhall, Fox, Austin. We went out to Brandywine with, IR with, with eels. It was IR-77 year. Whatever that was. Yeah, you're right. So it was still good. It was still, like I was still shredding. But Nitro had pretty much slashed me. And uh, I remember hitting this little jump. Not a little jump, but it wasn't huge or anything. Maybe Lucas was there. I think he did a front seven. Could have been another day. But uh, Mendenhall was there and I like did this front three... Uh, indie stomp and then I tried this cab seven that felt so awesome I wish I landed it but like I was riding well and then Eels probably said something to Tonino and they were like maybe we could get Ruba part in the movie this year or whatever but my budget was completely slashed and then I went to Vegas and I saw Tonino I'm like what are you like I don't what are you like I feel like I'm riding good right now honestly and I'm with all the strangers so I was I was feeling pretty good 
And uh, he's like, man, budget's blown, but we're going to give you five Gs <laughs> to film a part. <laughs> no contract, nothing here. Canada just, they gave me a check at the show. Here you go, take this and just do whatever you want with it. So I played blackjack and fucking lost it all. You gambled? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> No, no. But like they gave me that money. And uh, so I still had that, whatever. And then a little bit of uh, Billabong money. And I tried to hang with Justin then, but Brandon Keenan was also there. We did a trip to, a trip to Sycamus and I was with Sansloan and the gang. And then Brandon was with McKay and everybody over there. And I was like, oh, there's my secret spot over there or whatever, my wild card spot. But so I never actually ended up going back, filming with him at all that year. I maybe did one day and I second guessed myself on this line and almost died. But, uh, but so it was, it was, it was, the dwindle was on. So what year was that? It was 2011 something, but I still wasn't working. I still didn't have to work. And, uh, and then my brother got the call to join this band, <laughs> broken social scene. Remember this? Probably not. This is 2007. And he's like, we're going on tour in Europe. Do you want to come? There's room on the bus. I'm in. I'm not working. I can do whatever I want. I'm coming. And uh, I'm excited. I don't even I'm going on tour with this pretty big Canadian band. I'm excited for my brother. And, uh, and in the year, that year, throughout the, that year, I was actually helping my friend Sean Hughes paint houses or the odd like day I'd come in and I was good at it because I'm a ADHD nerd and uh, and I'm painting and uh, he left town. Anyways, I'm working my contract with Billabong, whatever. I'm going on tour with my brother's band and I get a phone call. Hi, I'm looking for Sean Hughes. I'm like, I don't know, Sean. I mean, I know Sean, sorry. He's, he moved away. He's actually gone. And he's like, oh, I heard he's a painter. I'm looking for a painter. I'm like, well, you know, I can paint. I'll, maybe I'll come check it out. So I cruise into the village. It's this spa. And uh, the girl's beautiful. And it, it smells se like sex in there or something. <laughs> sorry, Ma. Anyways, it, I'm just like, get this crazy vibe. I'm like, whoa, whoa, I got to get out of here. So I can't paint your place, but maybe I'll send McClatchy over. <laughs> I think I, I called McClatchy. He couldn't do it. So I leave and I go on tour with my brother and like it was three weeks. We're going to all these cities in Europe. It's awesome or not as awesome. I was like thought we're, it was going to be pretty rowdy, you know, but it was pretty tame. I didn't make it with any girls and came back to Whistler and um I had one night and they invited me on the U.S. tour because I started tuning guitars and like set up the stage and stuff. So they're like, want to come on the U.S. tour? We'll drop you off in Vancouver, go home, reload, and we'll meet you in Vancouver for the show. So I go out for the night, obviously, and I go to the Beagle. <laughs> Hold on, let me have this beer. Oops. And, uh, and I see, oh no, I see my ex. And I'm like, I got to get out of here. So I leave and I'm responsible and I order pizza from Domino's because that's the place to be. And as I'm walking there, this girl jumps out of the woods. Like, I really hope I'm telling the story right, but I'm pretty sure this is how I saw it. <laughs> and uh, it's the girl from the spa. Hey, what are you doing? Want to come back to the spa and have a party? And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> so anyways, go back to the spa and like, it's... There's not many people there at all, probably just the two of us. And uh, we'll just stop there. And uh, wake up in the morning and hit the road. I have to hit the road. Uh, I'm going on tour and I go on tour and I'm having the best time ever. And I get a message, ah, oh, babe, when are you back? And I'm like, uh oh, who's calling me, babe? Why? Like, this doesn't sound right. I show it to the drummer, like, sounds weird. Babe, 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 my brother got sick. I'm worried about you, babe. And I'm like, I don't even know you, babe. And uh, my mind starts twisting a bit. And I land after the three-week tour and wrist, I get a free pass for the ski hill, which was big. And I got my contract from Billabong, which was big. I'm like, life is good. 
I get home, but she's like, come by the spa. I need to talk to you. <laughs> so I go by the spa and uh, she's like, I'm pregnant. And I'm like, I don't even know this person at all. So I start walking home <laughs> and I'm like, okay, career's coming to an end. What is this? Who is this human? She's got the spa in the village and she's pretty cute and seems like she's got her shit together. And, and, uh, but let's get to know her. So I go home, I call her up. All right, let's go on a date. It's fine. Let's figure this out. And, uh, so we sit at Elements and, uh, have this dinner and, and it goes well, but like, I can't do this. I can't do this at all. It's not for me. <laughs> like she's not for you or a serious the relationship? The situation is not for me and she's not for me. Just the situation is not good. I'm like, I can't do this. Like I, I can't. So I start panic freaking out. Can't do it. Can't do it. Doesn't matter. It's not up to me kind of thing. And uh, I mean, the story is huge. It goes on. There's a lot of good detail there. That uh, so, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, I guess we're having a baby, and uh, you know, I can't go into too much detail, but you know, it's gonna happen. I'm really dreading it, and I don't want it to happen, and I'm kind of fighting it for sure. And then I think so. This is now October, and December. Risto invites me to Billabong Pipeline. And uh, so <laughs> I land in Hawaii and he picks me up and he's like, I've got great news. And I'm like, I've got great news. And he's like, I'm getting married. I'm like, I'm having a baby. It was so fucking awesome. So we get in the car, I tell him the story. It's fucking crazy. I'm staying at this hotel and I, I see all these like newlyweds or whatever. They all have their new babies. And I'm like, these are young couples. It's not looking good for me. And so I write her like, man, I'm, I'm freaking out. I can't do this. I can't do this. She's like, it's okay. I'm going to have an abortion. It's okay. And I'm like, oh my God, thank. So Risto changes my flight. We stay an extra day and we party and uh, I fly home. And I pick her up at like the clinic or something. She wants to have a consultation and we don't talk about it on the drive home. And uh, yeah, cause I'm an idiot, man. So I don't, I don't say anything. I just like, don't ask questions. I don't want to know anything. So she's keeping the baby now. <laughs> and uh, that's that new year's happens. Wait, I, she's keeping it. Yeah, no, now she's keeping, she's not having the abortion. And I think it was new year's. I was, I was walking losing my mind in the streets or whatever just a messenger like don't worry we'll, we'll figure this out don't don't do it or she was talking oh man this is actually probably a little later there's like a moment where you know you don't want to have an abortion it's i don't know maybe it's i don't know how many weeks in but we were pretty far long and she was thinking about doing it and i was like you know what don't do it i'm done we're gonna figure it out we'll make it happen whatever i was thinking crazy but I can't be together with this person. We're not going to be in a couple. We're not. We're just going to co-parent, I guess. And uh, I still haven't told my mother this. And then, um, and then, uh, yeah. So I start to hear some stories um, that you know maybe she had been with someone else. And I questioned her about it. And blah blah blah. You know, you could go crazy there. And uh, so I started second guessing, you know, like maybe it's not mine. Who knows what? But for now, this is my baby and uh, I'm not there at all with her. <laughs> like I'm not around. By then I'm hanging with Helen Scatini. I was going to say Shinetti. Anyways, I was, I'm, a, I'm starting to hang out with Helen. And uh, and uh, yeah, I'm having a baby with this other person. And Helen is just hanging out still. It's crazy. And uh, so then <laughs> my mom's going to love this. And then um, we're sleeping one night at Helen's and the phone rings and it's time to have a baby. Right. And I pass out till three in the morning. You pass out because of. I, I guess. I guess maybe I passed out. 
or yeah, I guess I f passed out. I don't know. I can't really remember, but I remember getting the call and then I woke up three hours later <laughs> and uh, I, I freak out and I jump in my truck and I'm driving to Squamish to have a baby and I see Taylor Godbear on the side of the road. I don't know her yet. I'm like, what's going on, Taylor? She's like, I lost my dog or someone's dog, Dan DeFila's dog. I'm like, okay, hop in. <laughs> so I drive Taylor to find her dog, find the dog, drop her off at her house, then continue on to Squamish and like run inside and I see her mother there and she's like, don't worry, deal with that stuff later. Just sit down here. We're about to have a baby. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and she's sitting next to me. She's actually like um, on her knees, hands and knees because she couldn't bend her legs or something. So she's having a baby that way, not like, you know. And uh, I'm holding her hand and I'm, you know, terrified. And next thing you know, the baby comes out and it shoots into my arms and it's screaming. And I'm like, what the fuck is going like on? Like a fresh baby. Fresh baby. Do you want to cut the cord? No, I do not want to cut the cord. But I'm holding this baby and it's insane. And I'm crying. Everybody, like you'll never experience, like I'm, I experienced that. It's insane. That emotion, totally insane. Anyways, so... The baby comes out and uh, they say it looks like me. And I'm like, oh, my God, it's crazy. And uh, I walk out into the hallway and I see a poster of pictures of newborn babies. And they all look like me. So I'm like, this is good. This is a good sign. And I walk down the hall and that's uh, that was it. I sat in my car and probably blasted two ciggies back to back. Sorry, guys. <laughs> And then I called uh, Sherlock and told him the story. Anyways, and drove home to Pem. I'm I'm a, I have a baby boy. Or drove home to Whistler, back to Helen. Like I have a kid now, and I, my snowboard career is pretty much going down the tube. So it's time to start maybe thinking of stuff. And uh, so yeah, that's when I started thinking of stuff. And uh, we changed diapers for you know two months believe it was two months and um helen was dropping me off to change diapers and then uh i had a paternity test <laughs> and then yeah we went and ordered a paternity test online boom drove up there swab in the mouth <sighs> didn't i missed the test results in my junk mail so it was like a couple weeks or something and uh and uh, I found them. And I remember calling her and like, all right, here they are. Like, you know, I, I hung out with, the, with him a couple of times now and I got to know him. So I was like, maybe I can still hang out with this kid <laughs> if it's not mine. And uh, sorry, I wasn't there if it was, if it is mine and whatever. We're going through the numbers and seriously, like the numbers are matching some of them. And I'm like, heart sinking. And I'm like, what? Oh my God. And then at the bottom, it says you are not the father and i'm like what the hell crazy and she's whatever we talked for probably a minute and i put the phone down and i walked towards the bathroom and i fell on the ground in tears just crying like tears of joy and i called my brother i'm like i'm not i'm not a daddy or whatever it was insane and then we went to earl's me calling adair and uh, a bunch of people and just celebrated holy fuck. Ultimate, ultimately like that was like the decider of my snowboarding but i did film some video parts after but like i knew i had to do something else because if i'm having a kid i need to provide i need to be there so i started to think about painting more maybe not though that could be a lie not a lie but i needed to do something i applied for a team manager job at dc it's yeah it's a small totally random i'm like I don't even know what I want to do. Like, I thought I was having a kid. And then it wasn't mine. Insane. Small baby steps, though. I feel like as soon as you found out that you were having a kid over the course of that, let's say, oh, yeah, true. It was, a year, it was a year. You would, your oh, mental yeah. shift yeah, yeah. would slowly, For without sure. you knowing, just like every oh, single yeah. day, you'd yeah. be like, I'm a dad. Yeah. I'm a dad. I got to hustle. I got to hustle. So I hustled and I started budgeting like crazy and just like, 
yeah, I started hustling and trying to do whatever I could. And then it just kind of kept going. And when the baby actually wasn't mine, I had a nice little nugget saved. So I bought a house. Is that the most and stressful just, situation of your life? Yes. For sure. Yes. I mean, I'm thinking of some other relationships that might be kind of crazy, but uh, that one for sure, like, messed me, screwed me up. A lot of, there was some weird stuff going on. Yeah. Yeah, super stressful. But when it was over, like, that's over. I didn't even tell my mom. Oh, you just swept it under the rug. Yeah. Fuck off. Yeah. Wow. Because my brother had a wild situation when he was 19, and I was like, man, my mom's going to lose it. So I didn't say anything. It was crazy. And then it turned out not to be mine. Does she know now? Yes, but not like this. Fucking hell. That is. <laughs> so from there, we don't have a baby. We keep filming, and but I start painting slowly because I actually enjoy it. And then, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Start painting and. Is that right around the time that you got the nickname the Mayor of Whistler? That was uh, <laughs> that was Fox in Austin, I think. It's like everybody came to town and like hit me up. Hey, where can I sleep? Or what can I? What? Where, where can you get us tickets? And I knew what to do, I guess. And so that's me. I'm the mayor. I well, I oh yeah, then yeah, 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 yeah. I kept treading. You're right, because I was still dating Helen. Well, a here's years. a question. Do you, do you think that? Your career uh, previous to Helen helped like facilitate and blossom her career because I feel like your career is going down. And then did you put no, a lot into Helen's no. or is it just no, no, she paved no. it all? Helen worked her ass off. I definitely like reached out to some people, but like she worked her, she, she worked hard. She really did. Like she, she, she was on that hip smashing her body. She'd broken her legs. She'd already, you always saw her leading up to like where she when she started getting hooked up and stuff like she was charging all the time she was always riding with the boys always going but i definitely you know i reached out to people it doesn't matter she deserved it i was talking to austin smith um and he kind of mentioned that the resort towns always have a, a mayor quote unquote and typically that's somebody who's underrated but beloved by all and I feel like that's kind of like exactly like that's exactly who you are. You're like kind of the underrated snowboarder because of your own doing, I almost think. It's okay. mo even more hearing your whole story. I'm more like I think that if you wanted it and meant like had a mental shift early on, I think that you could have really excelled. Learning now or what I've learned over the last couple of years with the business side of like my life. And like how obsessed I became with painting and trying to do my best. And like then looking back at like all the other jobs that I had with the same mentality. Um, I could have done that with snowboarding, but I didn't. 100%. But so like, what what's that about? Like I didn't, it wasn't a job. I couldn't. Like, Did you get scared at the end? Did you have any no, gnarly injuries? No. I think that you articulated it was just like, well, though. It was just like I didn't, it wasn't a job to me. Like I didn't, it, if it was a job, it wasn't fun anymore. Like I wasn't having fun going up at four in the morning to jump this thing. Like I wasn't having fun traveling to California to sleep on the floor in a hotel with Andrew Crawford who snores like insane and then go jump with, and I didn't sleep. Man, the casino is way easier. <laughs> no but i wasn't having fun i was like wasn't having fun people were giving me shit rick was giving me shit and i was like it wasn't fun i think that that's an honest yeah. question you had to ask yourself and because like, like yeah you guys this. have been going like rusty's been going forever like Sollers, renzi like awesome crew they're just everybody's having a great time or like i was just kind of this just on the weird outside wandering you know, hang with Rick and having a blast. And like, it's like, this wasn't, I, if I could go back now, I think it'd be a different story almost. What would you change if you like, could go back? No, but like, I really got to know Tonino. I really got to know Fox. I really got to know some people and over time, but at the beginning, you know, I was a little shy maybe or, or nervous or 
but like those guys are awesome. Like I met the raddest people through snowboarding nitro like team really like fuck man that was the sickest i couldn't that was the best well i have this poster of the entire team everybody's wearing black and i've got this like striped shirt on i don't know if you've seen it but like it's awesome man that i got to be a part of that for a second like i'm texting with owners like my like it's awesome it was cool it was a good a lot of fun that's a really good perspective but you chose yeah, to like, like bobby meeks in switzerland like i'm hanging with bobby meeks yes this is sick <laughs> He's my friend on snowboard.com. <laughs> um, Whitlake, like, come on. Do you get to hang out with Scotty? Well, he was on the couch. I don't know if he remembers that. He stole a bunch of pizza <laughs> from Team Challenge and was at the, on the couch. And then, but yeah, we've we've hung out a bit. Uh, me and Rusty ran into him, but he, I, mean, I think he knows my name. <laughs> I think he knows my name. <laughs> Brian said that you've always helped navigate so many youth. You've mentored so many people and in the early stages of their career, but you did it with like a really loving and not a bossy know-it-all approach. Like, did you, do you feel like you took this approach of being a little bit of the vet, the mentor, because to help people navigate their careers early on, just based on what you've learned in the know. past, or do you, did you just enjoy hanging out with the more youthful Probably hanging out with kids because I'm still fucking 20. But like. <laughs> You've just mentored so many, whether it's well, Mikey guys, Pedersen and Rusty and Brian and Austin and sure. me and Jeeves and like the list goes on. There's just been so many people that you've. I think it's with everything. It's all around, you know, it's with painting. You're just like, why not help when you can? You know what I mean? Like, so many you, people that you got like. There. You want to ask me a question? You, you want to find, you know, you need some help? I'll talk to you. I'll help you if I can. All the time. Everybody. Where did that come from? I have no idea. Probably my dad. I think. Because like, maybe not. My dad was like in his own little world, but I knew he had this like spot where he was like, fuck, fine. You know, like I'll help you too, you bastard. <laughs> uh, but it's been my whole life. You know, being ready, being, I'm always, I was, I'm very responsible. Like I've taken care of everything my whole life. Like I never asked for a cent. I never asked my parents for a dime. I paid for my own snowboards. I worked since I was 13. I did like five years at the golf course. I couldn't even lift a fucking piece of grass. I was tiny. How the hell do you work at a golf course if you're allergic to grass? To grass? I know. I know. <laughs> Holy fuck. I know. That's why I was sandstorm. I was a sand trap machine. <laughs> That's why I was sandstorm. But like, yeah, I just hustle. I moved to Whistler. You don't ask people for, I didn't ask for anything ever, 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 except for that Cooster email. But um, I'm down to help people because maybe, maybe I didn't get it or you know what I mean? Like, maybe that's something to do with it. Like, oh, no one ever helped me, but fuck, I wish someone did. Or maybe, maybe I wouldn't mind it once in a while. So like you need a hand, I'm there. I guess I have no. No, it's it's <laughs> something like, like that. Like look at the back of your your house. Your house is like a sled haven for exactly. every professional like, snowboarder. Just cause, but do you feel like you get taken advantage of because you're too nice? I feel one hundred percent, for sure. People take advantage of it, and then there's there's people that say it too. They're like, man, people take advantage of you, man, and then they go on and do it. And I just like to see that to be like, so who the fuck are you like to keep doing it? You know what I mean? Like I, I'm a tester. Like you're a fucking piece of shit. Not really, but like you see it everywhere and you're like, I'm glad I'm not that. Not glad, but like, you no, know what like, I mean? I totally know what you it's mean. It's like, you want to do it. You want, but that's not fucking impeccable or whatever you want to call it. Well, I think that when you see somebody living a way you don't want to live yourself, you're like, I don't want to be like that person. And so then it get. oh, if you're honest with yourself, then you get to check yourself to be like, am I like that person that I don't want to be like? Because I don't want to be like that person. But you first have to ask yourself in the mirror and be honest, are you actually like that person more than you would like to admit? Yes. Because I think a lot of people, it's easy to point the finger and be like, you're selfish, you're not. But then if you look at yourself in the mirror, like sometimes I ask myself, am I a good friend? And I just know that I could be a better one. 
being if I'm being honest with myself. But then there's lanes in my life that I am allocating like a large portion of my time to that I get better at, whether that's like health or like yeah, my yeah. relationship yeah. or my family or whatever. But being good at the whole pie is fucking tough. Yeah. But a good chunk of the pie should be allocated to being a good person. Exactly. And first and foremost, being somebody that's helpful. You got to do your best at everything. Have you read the four agreements? No. What's the, what's that saying? <laughs> well, the fourth rule in the four agreements is always do your best. So if you're not like, if I can do my best to help somebody, I'm going to do it. If I can't, I'll let you know. But I usually go out of my way to fucking satisfy the world or whatever. Take, do is whatever I can that I do forget to take care of myself or I, I screw myself over by not having the time to, you know, take care of my health or, you know. Where have you neglected your health? Uh, I'm going to say, I mean, I definitely work a lot, right? Yes. I, could, I don't necessarily think I eat unhealthy. I think I eat pretty good. Uh, there's a few habits that could I could lose, but there's a the mental game more than anything. Like there's something in here <laughs> that like I need to find a better balance for my brain. So you lose the sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so you lose like the anxiety and the stress levels and the shit like that. You know, like that's where I'm blowing it. Because I don't make time to just sit back and do nothing and relax. Yeah, but I, I honestly who... do. But like, I've had things in my head that they can, won't go away. You know what I mean? Like, whether like, it's painting all these houses or, you know, a girlfriend. Like, it's nice to clear your mind. And if you keep saying yes to everything, I'll never make time for that. Well, like you said right at the beginning, was balance. I think yeah, that, you gotta that's find the, the hardest balance. thing. Yeah. But like p finding the perfect balance of life is the hardest. And people don't deal well with with balancing because they typically want to be on some sort of high. And if you're on some sort of high, like whether that's like working really hard or, you know, whatever, partying or something that's bringing your endorphins like, yeah, I'm having a good fucking time right now. <laughs> it's like you don't realize that there's going to be a pendulum swing that goes yeah. back to the opposite. And that's why you kind of just need to hover in the middle there. You got to keep the anxiety and the stress down. Anxiety is going through the fucking roof. I yeah, feel like the more fun. people than ever have it. But I also think the reason why more people than ever, and I'm no fucking doctor, and nobody listens to a snowboard podcast to hear me be a doctor. But my two cents is that people without knowing it have too much time on their hands where before forever, we've always just been busy. Like but people hold on. Have been when you say people busy. have too much time on their hands... What are they doing with that time on their hands? Wasting it on their phone. Exactly. We all are. We're all yeah. guilty of it. So it's not too, like... For yeah. the most part. It's horrible. It's fucking horrible. Like, I get the anxiety load once in a while. Like, I don't stare at my phone. I don't post on Instagram much uh, at all. Uh, but I do look and scroll and get sick to see what, how much time people are wasting when your shit just disappears. Like, poof, no one cares. Pew, gone gone but you put so much time into something and it's gone yeah okay you're getting paid but look at your who's getting maybe they're getting paid but like wow my thing is the most cringe is seeing people running a social media account that is just anything but you know themselves and it's just like yeah. this weird thing and when you land on their profile for the most part all my friends most of your close friends, you just want to see them posting close friends things like hanging out with my dad this weekend. Yeah. They're like, oh, I burnt all the hot dogs. You're like, fucking right. Like, yeah. This is sick. And then some people you follow because it's like they're a professional surfer or whatever. And you want to see their best surf clips or whatever. Yeah. Then there's people who just don't need to be on social media and they're on it more than anybody. And you're like the person... Like, you're just like, oh, no, I landed on your profile and you're doing this again. And this it's is bad. so fucking cringe. It's bad. It's bad. And they're like trying to give you like health advice and they have 400 followers and they've never been educated. And it's <laughs> like, oh, my fucking God. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a wild one out there. Like, you could be doing so much more with your time. And I see it every day, like when I go home and I'm trying to do other things. But like, sometimes you just want to 
do nothing and stare at your phone, you know? If you did, there's the balance. Like, if you can squeak in, like, let's say some phone time, and the phone yeah. does, there is, there are aspects of yeah. your phone that are amazing, like seeing what old friends are up to and contacting your parents really easily yeah. and, like, taking photographs and storing them for, like, memories. Like, for the most part, it's a good device, but it's just that we, for the most part, we all abuse it. And most, most of us yeah. do, I think. Like, when I see, and like, it, my it cousins, was... it's like, gee, the younger generation, you're like, fuck. And it brings you down. Like, if you see stuff, like, I don't know, the last four years, I, I, I had a really busy four years in Pemberton. I built a house. I'm running the business. Uh, my my business partner or was going to be or whatever had a car accident, Adam. And, like, my brain was fucking fried. And I was... You know, every once in a while you're scrolling Instagram and you're seeing people having this fun and, you know, it's called fun. And I wasn't. I was working every single fucking day. Build the house, go home, work, build the house, go home, work, getting shit all day long, getting shit on, shit on, shit on. Stare at my phone it's like, and hear it from your friends like as well. Like, all you do is work. And like, I put myself in this horrible situation. It's my own doing, whatever. But like, you get down on yourself. So people that are down on themselves, like watching this shit, like I'm, I'll be okay, I'll live. But depression's a fucking weird one. Like there, people are hurting. Like if I was hurting, people are hurting out there. It's a wild one. The phone's shit. It's a fucking piece of shit. How did you get out of that slump? You know, your work partner Adam gets t-boned, so he's like completely written off it actually probably probably started before that and it definitely started you know this is going to be a interesting well not interesting but it could drag on but like relationships suck or do, they don't suck but i'm not good at them and i had a couple weird ones and you get thrown off and then i'm building this house with my two best friends and that relationship kind of went down the tubes pretty bad but we weren't done yet so we had to stick it out and grind it out like everybody told us this would be difficult blah 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 uh and then adam's accident so you know i'm on this four year grind like i think i work you know a f mentally every single day for the last four years just friday and uh i was wondering when it was going to stop you know because every day like we were saying earlier like the shit that's coming out of my mouth is just garbage you know you're you're bitching all day every day Every day, like everything that's out of your mouth is negative. Like, oh, man, I got to cut the fucking grass. You know, I should be fucking great, thankful. Like I, I have a property. I can cut grass. I own a house. I'm cutting my grass. Like, oh, man, don't own a house. It's the worst thing in the world. You got to. Why would you say that? It's horse shit. You know, I'm just. But every day something. Oh, I'm going to lose my wallet. Oh, I lost my wallet. Oh, well, everything I put out there was garbage. And I was getting it right back, nonstop, over and over and over. And uh, and then um, I ended up, what happened? I'll tell you right now what happened, Jody. So anyways, finished building this house, got rid of most of all that work that Adam said yes to, kind of cruising, somewhat feeling better. You know, my relationship went down the tubes. My mom moved out, blah, blah, blah. And uh, your mom moved in. Yeah, my mom moved in. And uh, so that was huge, too. But like the, I was trying to figure out what's the one like what, what what's the, the problem here? How am I going to fucking get over this? Whatever it is. And then uh, Mike Hart, he's going to love this. I hope I'm fucking on it. But uh, we had stopped talking. He's my longtime friend. 40 years. We built this house together. You know, it fell off. Shit, whatever. And uh, same with Kelly his girlfriend or wife or whatever. And uh, he, they came back this year and I saw him in the lift line quick and it was kind of awkward on the lift. Like, man, like, I don't know what just went down, but that was like the worst fucking experience in my life. That, and I thought I was going to have like the best with my best friends. We're going to finally build a house and we're going to, it's going to be amazing, but it wasn't. And uh, that was it. We saw him on the chair. Not much to message about, but uh then he writes me and says, hey, do you want to go snowboarding again before we go back to Mexico on the 28th of February? I'm like, fine, let's do it. And we went snowboarding. We kind of, you know, 
didn't talk about much and then boom we started talking about the house and that was it was big like you know I have my thoughts I'm sure he has his whatever and then we shredded came home and you know I, I I'm more of uh I'll reach out like I'll try to talk to people I find and like try to solve an issue or whatever. And maybe Mike's a little more contained and can't because clearly, you know, he was either pissed or whatever, but he wasn't responding much. But um, he said, uh, I'm really glad that we went snowboarding today. That was awesome. I haven't been sleeping. Uh, you know, this whole thing's affected my relationship. And he just, you know, I was like, no fucking way. Like, fuck yeah. Nice. I'm glad you felt like shit. You know what that means? Because you gave a fuck. You know, I thought you didn't care. I thought you were just like, here, I bought, I ended up buying them out of the house. And here's your chunk of change. I bought this thing. And like, that's it. We're done. You don't care. You just got your money and you're out. But sure enough, it sounded like he gave a shit. And ever since that day, it's gone. My depression, the whatever was in my head, has completely left my body my mind and I don't and now I recognize what was shooting out of my mouth so much so bad so much garbage that like I don't think I can do it anymore like I I, I catch myself even in my texts where I don't have a but I don't say someone's like hey how's your day I'm like oh yeah yeah it used to say this before like my day like the fuck my day sucked like and this is what happened No one wants to hear that shit. So like now when someone asks, like I could say, oh yeah, today pretty good. Some of you know, whatever, kick this. But I did kick, I did kick a can of paint over, let's say. I'll I'll just take that out of the equation. There's no buts. There's no bullshit. There's no shit. I'm trying to have no shit with everything. That's where the four agreements is. Be impeccable with your word. That's rule number one. So if you're impeccable with your word and you're not speaking garbage like I was for four fucking years, I'm not getting the garbage. About yourself too. Uh, for, for sure. For sure. I agree with that one. But there's moments where you like to joke about yourself. Like I call myself an idiot all the fucking time. You do Same. too. Yeah, yeah. But like it really does start there. And now thinking back because of what I'm learning now, thinking back into way deep in my past, like well, did I always feel like shit? Was I always this weird? Was I always hard on myself? And there's moments. There's little moments throughout time. Like the snowboard days, I don't I don't remember feeling, thinking I was shit, you know? Prior to that, maybe. A little bit here and there, but like where did it start? Where did it, maybe I am insane. Maybe, you know, like it's pretty cool. It's pretty wicked. Like if I can keep this up, I don't think I'll go back to fucking garbage life. You got to read that book. What are this? Okay, you've mentioned the first there. Do you know the second and third? Or the first one that? is be impeccable with your word. It all starts there, right? Like, whatever you say is gonna happen. You put it out there. You want shit, you'll get it, right? So, the second rule is don't take anything personally. I think they say this because if I'm not impeccable with my word. So let's say this, Jody, you're a loser, right? I'm not impeccable with my word. You're Jody, you're over there saying, that guy just called me a loser. Why the fuck is he calling me a loser? Is it because I, oh, maybe it's because I shit my pants when I was young or whatever. Maybe it's because of this, maybe it's because of that, right? So because I'm not impeccable with my word, I call you a loser, you take it personally, and then you hit rule number three, and you make an assumption. Do not, rule number three, do not make assumptions. So now you're trying to figure it out. I'm Jody, I'm a loser. Why am I a loser? I'm going to make an assumption as to why I'm a loser, and I'm going to feel like shit, and probably continue to feel like shit until I figure it out, right? So all because I wasn't impeccable with my word, you're feel like shit, right? So if you're feeling like shit, whatever, you got to figure it out. (laughs) And then once you figure it out, do rule number four, always do your best. So if you're always doing your best, if you're following on the rule, like, you can't, you can't fucking blow it, man. And you got to catch yourself all the time and recognize it. Like the other day I said something so stupid. 
stupid. It was more of a, you know, oh, I don't want to say it, but like, I didn't have to say that. Why would I say that about something? Just dumb. Like, That's, those are really good rules. I'm actually going to try and live by them a little bit more. You, you, you're good at them. Or you're good at like beating yourself up a bit, but I know you joke a lot. And it reminds me of when I was, would rise, when I would go hang out with Gilbert and like, I remember going on this nitro trip and we were hitting handrails and I was looking at this handrail. I'm like, why would I ever hit that? I'm going to smash my skull there and then I'm going to blow my knee out over on the lower step right there. I'm not doing it. So, but I, I knew I was never hitting that rail anyway, so I could say whatever the fuck I want. But like, I'm not hitting that. But he was always like, why would you say that? You know, like, don't say that because it might come true. Like, whatever, you know. No, that's good. Uh, that's, that's really good. I definitely speak sometimes with my closer friends that I'm filming with. I'd yeah. never do this with other yeah, yeah. people, but yeah. I'll speak the negative because I want people to be aware of the rock. So I'm like, yo, don't drift backside because yeah, yeah. if you land on that rock, you're going to yeah, fucking yeah, yeah. die. Yeah. But then at the same time, you're kind of throwing it out there exactly. and you're like, oh, it's like doable. So you got to stop that. Be like, hey, watch for those rocks. Just remember there's rocks over there instead of splattering your brains open on those rocks. Exactly. It's yeah. really, it's been, the, it's like it, the last six, since Mike actually said that, like, man, I can't. And I, I've been talking to people for years right now. Like I talked to my best friend, Jason, back home, like. Every day we talk, every morning on my commute to Whistler. And like, he, everything out of my mouth for like three, two, three years, like was shit. And I can't believe he had to put up with that. Like so much negativity, so bad. And now just like that, it's gone. It just seems like. It's well, gone. Dude, I'm telling you, the it's weight completely that you would, gone. It's insane. But the weight that you would be holding on a 40 year friendship with mike yeah, yeah. is a lot like it's somebody that like yeah, yeah. you're you got to communicate man or you're just gonna and be in the dark. i said this in the last episode too but it's like men are bad communicators and it's just like it. for the most part it's like and you did the assumption thing and think mike you didn't even oh, yeah. think mike cared. i'm a piece of shit he doesn't give a fuck man he yeah, doesn't care and about eats anything he just wants money 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 that's just, maybe not that's not the case that's an assumption like whatever yeah. But yeah, it was horrible, and then it's that's it. And now, like moving forward, you just like try to stay on it. Well, speaking of money, I feel like money in general makes most people. You never act. do anything for money, never. And I've had a lot of people tell me like, "Oh, you love working, you love the money, you love." It has absolutely zero to do with money. You know what it has to do with doing my best. If I'm not going to do my best, so like, I do these jobs. I love it. I love my work. I love helping the people like the clients or whatever the hell you want to call them like i i just like seeing people happy so if you're not going to do your fucking best then move on buddy and how have you seen a lot of trades workers like the work like dropping down as far as people taking pride in their work I just feel like whenever I go into a job site, it's like there's so many people you can just see that don't give a fuck that yeah. probably should read this book. That's what I'm saying. So they could just try, just to know, like, try if, their best. If you're actually not like anybody, everybody, if you're not going to, let's say you apply for a job. Like if you can't seem to, if you can't find a way to be the best at that job, then go move on. Don't waste time. Don't waste people's time. You know what I mean? Like you'll find your way. Maybe you have to, you need some money, so you're just going to do it. But like, find a way to do your best always. And if you're not, yeah, get the fuck out. Well, there's nothing better than going to uh, a low tier job and seeing the person doing their best. Because you can immediately realize that that I'm person you, is destined for the next chapter. Raking, like I was raking sand traps. I'm the fastest sand trap raker in Canada. And, <laughs> and I cut greens. Like I had this crazy mentality. Then I moved to Whistler and I started cleaning toilets at the world mark over here. Like I had the system and I won the employee of the month. I was making 10 bucks an hour. Who cares? Like everything has, I try to do, I find a way to make it. So it makes it fun or something like it's a challenge. Like right now with painting, there's so many different things. I'm pretty sure I've mastered my, whatever I'm up to new construction or whatever, 
that it's like so easy. It's like a checklist system, like from McDonald's cheeseburgers. Let's go all dressed, smash this trim out. <laughs> but like no one's having fun. They're like just always miserable because the... they're thinking about money all the fucking time. There's a system to making a Big Mac and there's a system to um, to doing anything properly. Yeah. But like, look at your snowboarding. Your snowboarding was kind of like that too. It's like, if you're going to do a method, why would yeah, you yeah, not yeah. want to do it to the best of your yeah, ability yeah. Yeah. and like pop and yeah. tweak and like the whole... Yeah, yeah. you got to ollie. You got to ollie. You can't just be a scrubber. I don't want to say names. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so t- let's hear some of your... Uh, yeah, I guess you kind of went through some of your favorite jumpers. Who Who are some of your... Favorite up and comers. Uh, so I wouldn't even have a clue. Just because you've been busy too fucking warrior. No, working. but like I watch your movie. You guys are all old. Well, yeah. Sean, Sean's ripping. Yeah. So like, I watch your movie, and uh, I mean, who's up and coming? I don't even know. I don't. I, well, Do you? Like, I mean, I know. Bryn, Bryn's ripping. Yeah. Bryn's ripping. Uh, Keenan's ripping, but like, I'm out. I don't even. Like, I don't. I watch your movie. That's about it. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I probably watch every single day before snowboarding and I do my stretches and then my mom watches. And then, yeah. How important are your stretches? Probably getting pretty important. How old are you? Dude, now? I'm Boy, ripping. Like, I'm not ripping, but I mean, like, my body feels good. See this talk, you know? I probably would say before, like, my body is fucking thrashed and I'm fucking over it. I don't say that anymore. I'm ripping right now. Like the first week of snowboarding this year, I was like, man, I'm done. Like my body was hurting and it was before the mic conversation, let's say, but like I was in pain because I had a horrible year last year because of Adam's accident. So I didn't get to snowboard much. I was miserable because of that. I was just miserable. I'm like, man, I'm actually, I'm done. Like I'm the old guy now. I'm done. But then a week later, I'm back, baby. (laughs) <laughs> i love that We've, we had like the best hit runs ah man that's all i need i don't need pow i don't need him go ride with wes and that's all i need well sorry nicks <laughs> cashy gabe yeah yeah right, we're right. all still like there's no slow there's no like slowing down you know it's not a i'm not just what's the point i love that the people that you're snowboarding with the list you just listed right sheen, there sheen sorry sheen you, those are the same riders that you were talking about at, in like mm-hmm. the beginning, whether yeah, it's yeah. like, you know, people that were in treetop. You know, people go different ways. People have families and stuff and that. Look at Pelshat still ripping while his hips out, but like he's ripped the whole way. His kids are ripping. But like some people have to take that little breather off to raise a family and come back. Like Sheen's still hungry. Like he won't stop. Well, look at the pillow. And he's got 12 year old or 15 or six. Who knows how old they are. But yeah, that will never stop, you know? Do you yeah. think you'll do another 720? For sure. Nice. I might need contacts. <laughs> but no, I went in the park. See, that was weird. One day in the park this year. And really? I hit the first jump, and I'm ready for more. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> but it's hard to get my crew into the park, so, I'm, you know, E-Man scares me. But Well, I'll, I'll hook you up. You can get on airtime. We can start paying you. I'm just waiting to get some mm-hmm. money. I got some. We're going to build the team. What about a cheeseburger sponsor? Yeah, Yeah, fucking put a cheeseburger logo up here. Give all the sales from uh, the circle. (laughs) I like it. Okay, I'm going to ask you 10 questions here in closing. I really like that last chapter there on fucking. What was it? What's that book called again? The Four Agreements. The Four Agreements. Do you have any other books that you would recommend? That's honestly the only. Well, I read a ton of poker books, but but, um, The Four Agreements, like, I couldn't put this thing down. So what happened was. I got dumped. Wow, whatever. Relationship ended. I dumped first, then whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm in the dumps for no reason because I'm an idiot. So Helen, my ex, says, "Take you need this book. And she ordered it for me. And I got it. And like, I started to read it. I couldn't put it down. I'd go to work on my breaks. I'd read it. I can't, Everywhere I went, I'm reading. I'm like, what the hell? I can't stop because it's so true. Everything in it, you're like, ah, oh, wow. Don't take it personally. I'm crying like that. What a fucking... Tough one. Reading. I'm on the plane. Everywhere I'm carrying this book, everybody's looking and being like, that's the best book I ever read. Isn't that book amazing? This is the best book. This is the best book. I'm like, yes, it is. You're supposed to read it three times. I read it once. I feel pretty good. Well, you actually like remembered what you read, which is what I feel like most people. It all, it's all there. You know this already. 
you all know we all know it the rules but no one is i mean i shouldn't say no one but like people need to rethink and reread and just remember that i think that the you, too many people live each day especially if you're dealing with some sort of mental illness they live each day the same or they don't change much and then they uh they're anticipating a magical result to happen out of thin air but like something as simple as like all right maybe i should cut out drinking some a bit maybe i should cut out x y and z like yeah you, you need know. to make power you, moves you, you know. need to make power moves but small steps don't and, overwhelm and you yourself need with to, the goal you need to you need to remember like you need to <laughs> like uh what am i trying to say here yeah, there's small steps, but it's hard to get the kick. You know, you need the, someone to boot you in the ass. Like, you know, I'd love to quit smoking, but like, man, it goes great with my life right now. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like, I feel like my habits are good, or whatever. They're not messing with my brain because the brain, I think, is the biggest one. If you do what makes you happy, you're going to live forever. Look, my dad didn't give a fuck. Yeah. Like, you do what makes you happy, you're going to die happy. Whether it's 60 or 90 or whatever, just stay happy. If you're going to be miserable, you don't want that. Like, my it's dad's not, going to go well. not promoting cigarettes at all, but my dad's seventy, turning 71 this year. Yeah. Smoked his whole life since he's been like 12 years old, full pack day. But like, he's a pretty happy, stress-free guy. Yeah. Like he's not living. He, he like, may go down in another way, but... If you're ready to tackle that, let's go. I just think that like he's seen people, a lot of his friends pass mm -hmm. who did do the like high stress job, always stressed out, stressed yeah. out relationships, stressed out family. Like, and then I don't know. I think that the stresses in life will take yeah. you out way earlier than yeah, yeah. your little habits. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and don't, yeah. You got to be nice to people, man, because you don't know what people are fucking going through. You know, like, you don't know. Like, I've had people say some pretty nasty shit to me. Like, what the fuck? How do you, like, thinking back on it now that I made it through the other side or whatever, let's say. Like, man, you're like a piece of shit for saying what you said to me. Like, I that's not impeccable, whatever. Like, I do not want to be your friend because of what you said to me. Whatever that was. So, like, be careful what you say to strangers. Be careful what you say to anybody, like. You don't know how fucked people are, you know, people, it's a weird time. I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of suicide. People are miserable. Yeah. People got to talk. People got to talk. People got to communicate. Just reach out. Just shut up. Stop being a bitch. But like, or not being a bitch. Sorry. But, uh, uh, some people don't make time to listen or s I remember like being in a spot and like begging, <laughs> like if I could just come over and. I know you're going to hear my shit again, but please just let me hear it. Just listen to it. You know, I love hanging out with you and hearing your <laughs> shit, but like, I like, you got to get it out. You're not asking for, I'm not asking, or like people aren't asking to like, I don't need you to help me with my problem. Just let me vent for a fucking second. Or, you know what I mean? Like, let it rip. You can tell me some things. Now, I came out like I, I, I thinking back to what some of my friends and I could tell they were worried about me. Like I could tell certain people were like, oh boy, what's going on over here? You know, it's crazy. I've never been worried about you. And maybe that's a bad thing because I would say I'm one of your close friends because whenever I hang out with you, it's just you always seem to think of the glass. I mean, you reiterated that you didn't think this for the last three, four years, but at least to yeah. me, you put up a front. But maybe because I'm not in your closest circle in Pemberton, because I've yeah. been kind of away, that when I would show up into your life, you would do like a everything's peachy. Yeah. But like, you know, sometimes, like you said, you don't know what the fuck people yeah. are actually dealing with. Because most people yeah. put on their like, it's like when you bump into somebody in the street. How's your day? Everybody, everybody in the fucking world says good. I'm almost waiting for someone to be like, my day has been fucking I terrible. love hearing <laughs> when people say something that I can re relate to. Kind of like, oh no, that's a fucking bad one, dude. You want to talk about it? Let's go. You know, we'll go on the deck. Like, I won't say names or anything, but very close friend of mine. Pull him on the deck. You know, have a beer after work. Have a ciggy. Oh, sorry. And, uh. A doobie for sure. Maybe some mushrooms and just like listen to the way people talk. And you're like, do you, you want to hear what you just said, buddy? 
and I'll repeat it. I won't say any names, but like, listen to what you just said. You want to know why you just said that? Because you're feeling this. And I'm not, I'm not telling you how to, uh, how I, it's a, what I think, but, but like, we only say, I've said what you just said before. And I felt like this, and that's where you're at, dude. Like you got to make a move right now. I just busted you, you know, like it felt good. And homie was like, you're right. You son of a bitch. That's exactly what it is. And I'm like, I don't need, you don't need to tell me that you have this, this, and this, and this. I don't care. You're my friend forever. You don't need to tell me that you have a house or, or money or whatever. And I've been in that position like, oh yeah, well, I own a house. Does it, I'm, I'm something because at one point I thought I was nothing. I'm trying to sell, you're trying to sell yourself like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's crazy. And you're like, don't, you don't need to do that. Shut the fuck up. You shouldn't have to sell yourself. You're good as you are. Maybe you stop fucking a couple of things, which take a power move. But yeah, that's the thing is the power move plays. Like I have lots of friends f across the whole world, and I feel like lots of them end up struggling with some sort of some form of addiction. It starts off trying to be fun, yeah. and then it ends poorly. Yeah. And it only ends poorly when they don't want to like use that substance whether whatever it is cigarettes drinking drugs whatever sex any of that when they they're no longer want it in their life it's like the party stops and you're just like fuck i don't even want to be smoking these ciggies or i don't even want to be drinking this thing but to what we were saying earlier is like if you genuinely just don't give a shit and you're just smoking ciggies like all the best but it's like if you actually want to quit that'll fucking eat you alive it's yeah. like the stress <laughs> yeah, of yeah, wanting yeah. to quit my cigarettes mom, will fucking stress you out so bad that you'll probably die yeah. from wanting to quit yeah. cigarettes my mom always said this like she smoked for her whole life then she quit for 18 years and she said the whole time it, it felt like there was a dark cloud over her head the whole time and i'm like <laughs> i don't want to live like that <laughs> Maybe don't ever then start Then she started smoking. again. She started again, and then she had a stroke. Now she fucking lives with me. Sorry. But, so yeah, you know, be careful. I think you got to be careful. You got to cut it I back. Think that, you got to like, cut it back. You can't go crazy. Like, you know, you can't drink a lot. You can't smoke a lot. You, can, you got everything in moderation. You know? Everything in moderation, except for make things sure you're that happy. Are historically just, sure just don't, don't work out for anybody. Make sure you're happy, man, before you do any of it. Yeah, but don't ruin your happiness throwing in some sort of substance that's not going to make you happier in the long term. Uh, okay, on that uh, on that note, uh, yeah, well, I'll ask you ten questions here. Ten these ones questions. Are, these ones are just quick, but uh, all right. Your favorite run on Whistler and why? Well, it's got to be that hit run there. <laughs> I don't even know the names. This year was Redline hit run, all the way to Garbanzo. So let's say Garbanzo hit run. Hits everywhere. We had no snow this year, but it didn't rain to the bottom. I mean, it didn't rain to the top or whatever. So the snow stayed and everything like formed different. Because we had no snow this year, right? There was no snow. It wasn't a great year, but I mean. But, like it didn't say... melt either. Yeah. It stayed there. Like you could ride to the bottom. Like anyways, the sh everything shaped different. There was gaps and I'd ride that every single day, every day. Fuck yeah. All right. Uh, number two, your favorite grab. I mean, if I was good, it would be, uh, no, you're right. Yeah, it's probably method. Or like a crooked cop, Melanie kind of thing. Well, Sheen, when I called him, said that you have one of the best methods in snowboarding. I thought like that was a pretty big compliment. I mean. Maybe he didn't say snowboarding, but he said you have one of the best methods. There's one. They, I, yeah, they can get there, but they seem off. I can't even grab my board anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the you're same. You're not supposed to say that. What's your, how should you approach that if you read the four well, agreements? I, I can't. I'm just being honest. Like I can't. I got to stretch. I'm like maybe if I stretch more, I'll I'll be able. Yeah, to Yeah, you got to put the why in first. Why can't you grab your board? Yeah. Probably because you need to stretch. No, but I tried to do methods and like they grab. Now I used to be behind the barney, then I'm here and I, I'm like not sideways. It's funny. I like your method style. You got to really uh, skate. You got to uh, stretch. All right, number three. One motto to live by. Always do your best. <laughs> nice. Uh, number four, uh, your favorite book. You kind of went through that, but... Another one? Yeah, that one is great. I guess, you know, I read a lot of poker books, which there's one called Painless Poker, and it's like a walk through life as well. Like, like 
there's a story you tell and you have emotions throughout a hand, let's say, when you play poker, like this is your story you're telling and sometimes you get punched in the face and uh, peaks and valleys. Yeah. So uh, it's a good book. Anyways, Painless Poker. Um, Number five, favorite poker hand. I don't think I have one. What? Yeah, I don't think I do. I mean, I th- see like a nine eight of diamonds or a nine ten of spades. But yeah. like, yeah, it's probably those two. I think mine's Suited connectors. Mine's jack nine diamonds. I don't know why, but I've always just yeah. hit those well. little weird connectors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. nice. Are you coming to Vegas? I'm going on the twenty second. Who are you going with? Corey Gallon of whiskey. Nice. No Corey Gallonowski. He used to work at the Circle back in nineteen ninety four. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, all right, favorite golf course. Wow, I mean, uh, Big Sky is amazing. I, I haven't played many. I'm just new to golf. Well, not new, but new to golf. Your intro to fucking yeah, bam yeah. is yeah. But golfer. you see that swing? It's ridiculous. <laughs> I don't even know what that was. But like, I grew up at the golf course, and really, Big Sky is awesome. I mean, Ch- Chateau is good. Too. Nothing compares to Big Sky. Nice. Really. Um. All right, next place you're going to travel to? <clears throat> Portugal. Why do you like Portugal? I don't, never been. My buddy just moved there, my best friend, uh, J-Rock. Nice. Yeah, you coming? Sure. Um, one trick you've always sucked at? Front side fives. In the sandbox jump, you have the sickest front five on that jump. Yeah, but uh, I wasn't trying it. <laughs> oh, that was supposed to be a poppy front three? Probably. <laughs> oh, nice. And then there's, uh, but yeah, front side five, I, I never could figure out a grab that I enjoyed. Oh, Melon was all right. But I never, yeah, I never found a grab that I liked. Front three nose. You have the king of front three noses. I I was talk- when I was talking to Brian, he said that you have the best front three nose in snowboarding. It's because I invented it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there was a front three nose, the first one ever done in the history of snowboarding. Neo Proto teaser. Rick filmed it. I'd never done one before. It was stepped down in Callahan, but not big. It was like the size of the ceiling. And my hand just kind of was like, and it was like filmed on 16 and it was in the teaser where the rest of the teaser was digital, digi or whatever. And it just, I just didn't look like I was part of the gang, man. Get me out of there. But it was sick. Try to find it. Talk to Pierre. I will. All right. Number 10. Who is the goat? I mean, it's got to be Terrier. I mean, he's amazing. I just wish that his, his uh, personally, the more I've like looked at this and talked to people, I just felt like his apology um, should have just been without the butt. So whenever I get in a fight or a relationship fight, yeah, yeah, you know what stuff. I mean? It's just like you're in a yeah, fight yeah. with your partner and then you finally are like, or not finally, but you, yeah. you're like, you know what? You're fair enough. You made some valid points. But, yeah. I'm wrong. But if you follow it up with the butt. I think it's whack. The whole thing, I don't even know it. All of it is fucking neither. horse shit. Sorry. Maybe I'm going to get canceled. <laughs> but like, really? I've seen some gnarlier shit out there at trade shows on fucking signs. Like, I don't even know. I, honestly, I don't even know the story. All I know is Terry is fucking awesome. And uh, yeah, it's the best. I don't know him at all. So I don't know him at all. I mean, I've shredded him a couple times, but I probably shit my pants. And uh, but like, man, I grew up watching Terry A. And I think people have made brushing. him out to be worse than he is. I just think that his apology was, was he followed it with a butt, which is just kind of a bullshit apology. Uh, we've had such a weird ride, wild ride. Like, I don't know. Anyways. But definitely what you're saying about at the trade show, there was like crazy stickers that like companies like, like ride. That yeah. Are so ride, on- ride should be fucking shut down. Then <laughs> ride should be fucking done. If no one's talking about it, that's horse shit. They had it fucking straight out right there. <laughs> Boom. Everybody's fucking canned done. Shut the fucking thing down. If you're shutting Terrier down, think about it. People, I would just people say- blow it all fucking day long. Everybody on this planet, blows it that you don't have to cancel the world like i don't know what i'm saying maybe i'm drunk i've had one beer <laughs> but like really man i see i hear people blow it right now like i'm gonna fucking post them online 
<laughs> my thing <laughs> is I don't <laughs> think that he was trying to be as vicious as some people. Like some people, yeah, I think genuinely exactly. are like Terrier doesn't like the gay community it's and it's, or the queer community. And it's like, I know people that actually know him and it's like, he's friends with people he in the queer care, community. Man. And I, I think that, I think that's where he came from is like a place of like frustration more than anything. But at the end of the day, his apology sucked. that he needed to make sucked. I don't know. Terry rips, uh, Travis rips, uh, who's a goat. There was one other goat. Craig Kelly. <laughs> Craig Kelly. But Brushy, I wish he was still ripping. Christopher Nix. Oh, yeah, that's who it was. <laughs> Chris Nichols. <laughs> Who's in... Uh, do he you invented know, the rodeo. Yeah. He's in full on... He's going pro golfer now. It is weird, though, because we dove into the Terrier thing, how, like, I have a podcast now, and I'm, like, deathly scared to touch on those any of these subjects. And it's like, it's uncomfortable. It's like, these are things that are happening in snowboarding and Terrier's name is going to come up and you see like, like Torment the other day, which is a magazine that was, is a huge advocate for the LGBTQ plus community and has done so much for that community as far as I'm concerned, posted a Terrier photo the other day. And I got a couple like messages being like, should this be happening and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, dude, like, do you really think that? The people that are calling him out, do you really think that you don't have any demons in your closet? Exactly. Do you want to fucking get called out, buddy? Let's go. <laughs> like, let's pull like, out all your everybody's demons that blown aren't on it, radio. And everybody's blown it somewhere. No matter what. Like, fuck off. We've all made mistakes. Yeah. Everybody's made mistakes, but back to the whole... There's no, if you're going to make an apology, yeah, 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 don't go. follow it with right, the Terry's butt. out. That's the that's the truth. Yeah. Anyways, Rube, you're the best. Okay. Thanks for coming Thanks on the for podcast. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, that's fun. I'm coming in for a secret. Uh, I'm gonna come in here once in a while and hang out. Yeah, please do. The place is open for you anytime. You need another. Uh, anyways, yeah, sweet. You got any uh, closing words for a young Rube that just moved to town? If you're not having kids, take care of your mother. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, uh, any young kids coming to town? Yeah, just, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Good luck. All right. Cheers, everybody. Thanks yeah. for tuning in.